all of the data, all of the measurements, all of the information point back to you and I, asking us to remember, asking us to once again know the mystery within. Collectively, as we approach this time in history that the ancients called the shift of the ages, our own science is directing us back to ourselves, back to the very nature of our being, back to what is very possibly the single most sophisticated technology ever to have graced this world with its presence. It's the mystery of you and I, the mystery of life. Through this mysterious force, expressing as our lives, once again we will know ourselves, and in that knowing, once again, you and I will remember. As I began putting this presentation together, um, it was so clear to me through my life experience and my life path that compassion would play such a key role in the unfolding of this information. Uh, through my life experience, two near-death experiences in 1959, leading to a series of synchronistic experiences, uh, sacred journeys all over the world, culminating in Mount Sinai in 1986, uh, in early 1987. Uh, compassion became to me the key to the graceful transition that we are asking ourselves to allow uh, as we live these days of the shift of the ages, the ancients called the shift of the ages. In, uh, in looking for an image that to me conveys the feeling of compassion, I came across uh, this image, the image uh, of Archangel Mikael from uh, an artist, a very good friend of mine, uh, Cheryl Yonbach Rose. She lives in the Mount Shasta area. She created this image the evening that the United States began bombing in the Gulf War. She went to bed that evening after turning off the television and, and seeing that we had, in fact, uh, begun the bombing. And this vision came to Cheryl. It's a vision of Archangel Mikael enveloping the earth in the power of his presence. And as you can see, he is in prayer over a very specific portion of the earth. This is over the Middle East where the conflict was occurring. And the entire earth is suspended over this cup, the chalice cup of Christ, the cup of transformation. And Cheryl had a prayer that came with a vision that evening. And to me, her prayer embodies the science of compassion. Her prayer was this that no one would ever win this conflict, that no one would win this war, that there were no rights and no wrongs, that somehow the entire experience would be transformed into something greater in its outcome than it was in the components of its beginning. Well, you and I know that the history books uh, will show that the United States won the war in the Gulf, and uh, it remains to be seen, uh, I believe, as to whether or not anything was really won or not. I will use this, uh, this image often uh, to convey to you, for me, the, the epitome of, of the science of compassion, uh, the recognizing of the nature of the conflict and the allowing of the experience. Within our modern culture, the 20th century idiom, our scientists are seeing events, unprecedented events. Uh, events that we have no reference points for at all uh, unfold before our eyes. We're seeing them on our Earth. We're seeing them far out beyond our Earth into interstellar space that surrounds our Earth. For example, in 1991, this, uh, this is an image of the Milky Way galaxy, a spiral galaxy that we live in. Uh, because we live within the Milky Way, we cannot actually photograph the actual Milky Way. This is a, a simulation of, uh, of a similar galaxy. Uh, in the center of our Milky Way, the great central sun, as the ancients called it, there is a, a mysterious radiant source of information. Well, in 1991, scientists began to notice a new frequency, a new wavelength, a new band of light radiating, triggering from the center of this Milky Way, bathing the stars and the suns and the planets in a new light that had never been experienced before. What does this light mean? Why did it happen and why is it happening now? As we look into our solar system, uh, and you don't have to look very far really to see that our scientists and our researchers are spending a tremendous amount of time and money uh, exploring throughout our solar system with the probes, the Magellan probe that uh, mapped over 90% of the surface of, of Venus. The Ulysses probe we'll speak about in just a minute uh, that is exploring the, the surface of the sun. Um, 
the, uh, uh, the probe's Voyager that has traveled far beyond uh, the edges, the, the outer reaches of our solar system. All these probes, the Viking probes in 1976, went to find life on Mars, biological life, never expecting to find archaeological evidence over 500,000 years old. Well, this information, this kind of information, our scientists have access to this information. There appears to be a, a discontinuity, um, a lack of continuity between the events as they see them unfold. Researchers believe that as they are witnessing these phenomena, that they are discrete, non-related phenomenon. Uh, let's go into some of these. Let's look at some of this phenomenon as, uh, as we delve into this information and begin with the sun. Our sun, the radiant uh, uh, ball of light that we call our sun, is undergoing a tremendous change that began in the mid to late 1980s. What we began to see was an increased number of solar flares, solar prominences, tremendous X-ray bursts, uh, solar flares that, that traveled across 93 million miles of space and actually lapped against the atmosphere of the Earth, interrupting our magnetic fields and, and playing havoc with our, uh, wreaking havoc with our weather patterns. Well, in 1994, um, our scientists, uh, American scientists, built a craft, the Ulysses probe, and we sent that craft to the sun to investigate further, to see what's really happening here on the sun. The first thing that they did was they traveled to the south pole of the sun to measure the magnetic fields. Now, we've measured these magnetic fields uh, from the Earth in the past, and we've always believed that the sun, in fact, has a, a polarity in the magnetic field. And what we discovered in, uh, in late December of 1994 was that as the Ulysses craft began measuring the uh, polarity of the south pole of the sun, the readings were much lower than had been expected. The scientists said, well, that's interesting. Let's go to the equator and see what's happening at the equator. And it took a few more months, and by May of 1995, the Ulysses craft was uh, at the equator of the sun and again took readings. And to the surprise of our researchers, they discovered that the readings were very low and very similar to the readings that they had taken at the south pole. So they said, well, let's go to the North Pole and see what's happening. So the Ulysses craft then traveled to the North Pole, we consider it to be the North Pole of the Sun. And what they discovered was this, that the readings from the North Pole, the South Pole, and the equator were very, very similar. There was not much differentiation between North and South Pole. And what scientists are actually saying now is that the Sun has lost its polarity. The Sun has lost the magnetic fields uh, the polarity of those magnetic fields and has moved to what is called a steady state magnetic field and that field is decreasing rapidly and that will be important in just a moment uh, so I'll ask you to remember to just to hold this uh, hold this thought that the Sun is losing magnetics losing its intensity of magnetics very quickly and we'll come back to that in, uh, in just a few minutes Jupiter, oh, a beautiful planet. Uh, I love to see these images, these uh, computer-enhanced images taken from, uh, from several different craft. The storm, this red eye that we see on Jupiter, this storm, uh, apparently uh, unlike any storm we've ever seen on Earth, because this storm was first recorded over 3,000 years ago by Chinese astronomers, and it has been continuously raging in the atmosphere of Jupiter for uh, approximately 3,000 years. Well, as you can see, this storm, the giant red eye in this storm, has a rotational component. You can see that there is a, there's a feel of, of a rotation on that component, or a rotational component on this storm. For over 3,000 years, astronomers have seen that rotation in a very specific direction. Uh, something interesting happened in 1986, 1987, uh, uh, synchronistically, perhaps, uh, just about the same time that the sun began going through its changes with the increase in the solar flares and the, and the X-ray bursts. This giant storm began to rotate in the opposite direction and continues to do so today. What would cause a rotation, a shift in an atmospheric phenomenon that has been constant for at least 3,000 years? What would cause that? Well, again, in 1994, uh, not long after... Um, the Ulysses craft measured the magnetic fields of the sun, you and I witnessed an outrageous phenomenon by any standards on the giant of Jupiter as we saw uh, through our live cameras 
a, a single fragment of something, and, and right now we're not even sure what that something was. Some people believe it may have been a, a comet, some believe it may have been an asteroid of some kind. A single body moving quickly toward this, uh, this giant, and within uh, a few days of impact, that single fragment breaking into 21 separate fragments, and those 21 fragments impacting the, the surface, the gaseous uh, atmosphere in the surface of the Jovian atmosphere. We saw that we witnessed this rare event uh, live in real time. Scientists speculated that this phenomenon would, uh, would affect Earth in several ways. Um, they speculated that, first of all, that the water vapor in Earth's atmosphere would be affected and that it would rearrange that water vapor, shifting the weather patterns on the Earth. And that's precisely what happened. You've seen that. We're still seeing the effects from that. Scientists also speculated that the magnetic fields of the Earth may, in fact, be impacted by the shock waves. Every time one of these fragments struck the Jovian atmosphere, a shock wave traveled across interstellar space, essentially striking Earth each time one of these fragments struck Jupiter. 21 fragments struck Jupiter. Earth was hit 21 times by 21 wave fronts uh, within rapid succession. The magnetic field, why you care, what these phenomena mean to you, to your emotional state of being, to your feeling world, to the relationships, the interpersonal relationships, to the genetic makeup of your being, as, uh, as this similar as this information may appear. The reality is that all the phenomena that we are speaking of now are, are directly related and in support of a process. And it's a process that you are living in your world, in your lives, in your bodies in this moment. And all of these phenomena, I believe, are byproducts of a much greater phenomenon that is occurring within here. That's where we'll be going with this for the next couple of hours. The shock waves in Jupiter. This is a, a computer-enhanced image of uh, one of the shock waves from the point of impact. And you can see the wave radiating out through the Jovian atmosphere, through the gases of the atmosphere. Uh, and then on into, um, across space, into uh, the proximity of the Earth. The planets in the outer reaches of our solar system, there is a phenomenon, there's a mystery that's unfolding uh, with our Earth scientists right now. In the past, up until the present time, we have always believed that the planets in our solar system were heated through the radiant, uh, heating process of, of our sun, our local star, radiating heat through tremendous expanses, vast expanses of space. Well, there's an interesting phenomenon that's happening now in that our sun is cooling. It's actually cooling down. Another part of the phenomenon that the, uh, the Ulysses craft is investigating. And while the sun is cooling, the planets, and especially the planets in the outer reaches of our solar system, are heating up. There is a, a heat that is coming from an internal source that is not well understood uh, in, in the past in these planets. The mystery is, where is that heat coming from? Why are these planets heating up now? If it's not coming from the radiant heat of the sun, what is generating the heat within these planets? Well, to understand, really, what all of this, is in, this information is all about, we may study out there. We can look out into the, uh, uh, the outer reaches of interstellar space. And we are finding information that is useful to us. Right on our own Earth, in our own Earth, is where uh, we're really, really beginning to understand um, the meaning of what these phenomena mean. And I'll be very clear about this right now. For me, understanding the meaning of the events as they're unfolding in our lives provides a context. And it is within that context that you and I will move very quickly beyond the charts and the graphs and the magnetics and the frequencies and all the things, all the technical things that we're speaking now. We'll move beyond that into the very real, the very feeling, the very emotional world of our day-to-day -day lives and our relationships and why those patterns, why the patterns of relationship are shifting so quickly right now and what that means to the genetic makeup of our bodies as we approach this time that the ancients called the shift of the ages. So, so this is where we're going with this information. We're providing a context within which uh, everything that we will do for the rest of the afternoon 
will hang as, as uh, within the framework of this context. As we look at the Earth, uh, we are seeing unprecedented phenomena uh, unfolding throughout the systems of energy that allow Earth to be Earth. Social systems, political systems, economic systems, geological systems, meteorological systems, agricultural systems, as different as they all seem, they are simply patterns of energy, patterns of information that are bound together, held in place through common threads of vibratory experience. And those threads are shifting. As they do, Earth shifts in response to those threads. Now, this is a, a map, a, a portion of a map, uh, of the, the tectonic makeup of the surface of the Earth, the tectonic plates that move and slip over the inner portions of the Earth, uh, allowing Earth the expression of, uh, of crustal features. And what you're seeing, if, if you were able to see this clearly uh, on your screen, you would see along each of these plate boundaries a series of red dots. Each one of those dots represents a, a seismic event. And what we're seeing is that we have an unprecedented number of seismic events, earthquake activity, occurring globally in our world right now. Some you hear about uh, if it's local, if it's in North America. Uh, recently, within the last year and a half, we have had earthquakes throughout the Midwest, Indiana, uh, Missouri, Kentucky, uh, in, in the Northeast, in upstate New York. Uh, something interesting is happening in California. When I uh, had the opportunity to work as, as a geologist uh, for Phillips Petroleum in the, uh, well, it was in the mid to late 1970s, uh, there was a number, a telephone number, a hotline that you could call for the United States Geologic uh, Service survey. And uh, on that hotline, daily, they would report the numbers of seismic events occurring uh, in different parts of the country. So in California, for example, they would say level one on the Richter scale, we had five seismic events. Level two, we had three or, or whatever it was. Well, recently, USGS has had to stop that service for level one, level two, and level three events because there are so many of them, they cannot discern where one ends and another begins. It sounds, to, uh, to the researchers, it sounds like one continuous rumble under the surface of the Earth uh, with not much break in between. That's the good news. What that means is, is that the crustal pressures are being relieved gradually uh, as we would, we would choose for them to be uh, without much notice. Uh, we've never seen this happen before. Uh, other parts of the world, in Japan in 1994, there was uh, an event, a phenomenon. Through geologic standards, it's, it's outrageous. If you weren't following the tech journals, you probably did not see much of uh, this piece of information. Uh, in late 1994, there were a series of earthquakes in southern Japan, which is not unusual in and of itself. What was unusual was the number and the severity. Instead of having one or two or three or five or ten or 30 or 40 or 60, there were over 70 consecutive sequential seismic events that happened in Japan in December of 1994, and they were non-related. It wasn't like one was triggering another, was triggering another, was triggering another. They were independent, non-related events. We saw something very similar in Southern California um, uh, not long ago, actually on my birthday, on June 28th, uh, in Southern California, when two independent, simultaneous earthquakes uh, uh, were triggered at precisely the same time. Up until that time, researchers had never seen a phenomenon like that before. It had always been one triggering another two of them happening at the same time within just a short distance of, of one another. So we're seeing unprecedented uh, numbers and degrees of seismic activity uh, all over the world. In Bolivia in 1994, uh, I was in Peru with a group. We had uh, just uh, were completing a sacred journey through Lake Titicaca. And we were actually on the water in the lake when just across the Bolivian border there was uh, an earthquake with an epicenter 400 miles beneath the surface of our planet, 400 miles. We didn't feel that earthquake, and we were just a few miles away in the water. Where they felt that earthquake was in North America, in Toronto and in Denver, Toronto, Canada, and in Denver, Colorado. And researchers said, why? Why didn't the people in Peru feel that earthquake? And the reason is, and what they now know, is that that earthquake was showing us something about the interior of our Earth 
uh, that was very different from what we had believed in the past was the, the true nature of the interior of, uh, of our Earth. Even if you're not aware of any of the other events we're speaking about, you do not have to look very far to see nearly every major publication within the last few years has either developed a, a special issue or devoted a large portion of, of a regular issue to unusual phenomenon. Uh, Time Magazine did a beautiful expose on, um, uh, on the, uh, the vanishing of the ozone layers. Uh, what this article is actually saying, it was uh, in part uh, a research project through NASA, what they discovered was that the ozone was disappearing much more rapidly than they had ever, ever suspected. Uh, and even before the research was finished, Time went to press with this article. Uh, a fascinating article, and I'll share some perspectives with you on why this may not be uh, such a bad thing that's happening. It's a little bit different different viewpoint what's happening with uh, here with the ozone. Um, Scientific American, Science News, uh, all of them are talking to science and tech journals about global patterns of weather changing. Some say that we're, we're warming up, the greenhouse effects. Some say that we're cooling down, moving into a new ice age. Which is it, one or the other? Um, the... Um, the new diseases, uh, the new viruses. Why is it now, within the last few years, just before the close of this grand cycle of experience, why is it that we're seeing uh, unprecedented numbers of viruses? HIV, for example, we had the HIV virus. Our bodies didn't know what to do with it. And now we have HIV-1 look-alike, HIV-2 look-alike, HIV-3, 4, 5 look-alike, the hantavirus. Uh, first uh, found in, in the Four Corners area of, uh, of northern New Mexico. Uh, old viruses that we believed were cured, such as polio, now coming back with a vengeance. The, the antibiotics and the materials that we developed, the chemicals that we developed, we believe to cure these viruses, the viruses like them now. They're coming back and, and they're coming back with a vengeance. Why is this happening? Why is it happening now? What does it mean to you? What does it have to do with everything else that we're talking about here? Planets heating up in our solar system, uh, unprecedented numbers of earthquakes in our, uh, um, in, in our planet. Well, in addition to those phenomena, we have uh, some even more uh, beautiful phenomena, I believe, uh, and pretty outrageous at the same time. Phenomena to, to look at, crop circles. Uh, crop circles first appeared in numbers, in large numbers, uh, mid-1970s, 75, 76, right around in there. Uh, and for those of you that may not be familiar with the crop circles, I'll review them just briefly. Uh, they were simply uh, circles, patterns, uh, in cereal grain crops in nearly every crop producing country in the world where the, the stalks of grain in an authentic crop circle, where they are gently bent at a 51 degree angle, they are still alive, they still produce their fruit, they may still be harvested if, if they're uh, done early enough in their season. Um, researchers have discovered that samples of grains taken from within the crop circles are very different from the control samples that are taken outside of, of the circle. Uh, for example, the crystalline structure is different within the, the, uh, the circle than it is from uh, outside the circle. Seeds that are grown from within uh, samples taken from within this crop circle germinate very quickly. They uh, bud very quickly and they produce more berries per unit than those taken from outside of the circle. Uh, there are certainly are crop circles and glyphs that are hoaxed and they do not uh, uh, produce the same phenomenon. They are not gently bent at a 51 degree angle. The stocks are actually broken on those. So in the mid-1970s we began to see uh, an increasing number of, at first they were circles and the researchers were quickly uh, quick to say they're either hoaxed or their uh, their natural phenomenon. They're just uh, wind whipping these crops into into vortices. Well, we began to see things like this, uh, and I put this slide in here so that you could see the detail, the interwoven nature of the stocks. It's pretty difficult to uh, to hoax something like this, and especially over uh, glyphs that are two and three hundred yards in diameter. Uh, an interesting side note: in 1994 for the first time, we've never found any animals that were uh, caught up in within any of these crop circles, probably because most animals, when they uh, hear or sense whatever it is that's creating these circles, the animals run. 
Well, there is one particular animal that does just the opposite of that, and that is a porcupine. Uh, porcupines, when they sense danger, they simply curl up into a ball and stay put until the danger has passed. Well, in 1994, for the first time um, in Canada, there were two porcupines whose quills were actually woven into the structure of the crop circle as it was unfolding. Uh, they were no longer living. They were, uh, they were very flat at that point, and, and their quills uh, were very easily woven into uh, the structure of this crop circle. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's the first time that, that that's happened. So, uh, so we see these complex patterns that uh, are very difficult to, um, to hoax. Well, the simple circles began, began to become more and more complex. Uh, each year, the number of circles would increase through the mid, uh, mid 19, uh, uh, early 1990s. And each year, there would be uh, a, what was called a grand finale, the, the greatest, most complex, uh, most beautiful crop circle of all. This particular uh, image here is from uh, uh, 1993, I believe. Uh, and this is considered to be the grand finale of 1993. Well, the researchers that were saying um, we had a, a natural phenomenon of wind whipping these crops into vor uh, vortices looked at this and they said, well, this is pretty complex. It looks very intentional. Maybe there's something else happening. In 1995, a body of information at a crop circle conference in England. Um, and while we were there, crop circles were appearing at the rate of about 11 per day all around uh, the area where we were at. Uh, the next slide that I'll show you is what I consider to be the grand finale of 1994. A beautiful image. Um, of a, a very powerful pattern in the science of sacred geometry. If, if you're familiar with sacred geometry, you know that this is called the seed of life. And it, it is an integral component of, of a greater pattern called the flower of life. If you are not familiar with sacred geometry, you simply know by looking at this, you sense, you feel that there's something important happening here. This is a very powerful resonant symbol that we have. Well, 1995 uh, crop season has just completed. We just got the slides back. I haven't really shown them uh, to many people. Uh, and the next image that I have is, for me, one of the most interesting in 1995. And what you're seeing here, many researchers uh, believe that we're seeing a, a model of our solar system. Here's the sun in the center. And just beyond the sun, you see Mercury in the orbit of Mercury, Venus in the orbit of Venus, the orbit of Earth, and there's no Earth in this orbit. And then Mars and the orbit of Mars and the asteroid belt and its orbit, and we're not seeing anything beyond that. So many researchers, they believe that this is saying uh, something very similar to what many of the crop circle messages have said, and that is simply that there is a change unfolding upon the Earth, upon within the lives of the people upon the Earth. Uh, I do not necessarily believe that this means Earth is disappearing. I believe that Earth, as we have always known Earth, is going through a tremendous transition and will probably never look the same following the transition as it did before that. I am uh, not intending to suggest here in this slide that there will be no Earth at all, simply not the same Earth as we've seen before. Well. Um, we're seeing these, uh, these glyphs appear in many, many places, and but some uh, actually very unexpected places. The next slide that I'll show you is a slide that came to us from uh, a little town known as Shaughnessy. And in Shaughnessy, what we see is uh, the caption on the picture here. It says, they've been seen before in Shaughnessy, but Doreen was still unprepared for the eerie rug circles that she was seeing in her living room. So maybe they are appearing in some other places. Uh, I don't know. Of course, this is ridiculous. Uh, and it's not that far from a phenomenon that is actually happening right now. I have not seen crop circles in people's carpets. Uh, I have seen uh, actual photographs of glyphs that are appearing in places where there are no crops, and they use whatever media is there. Uh, in the ice, frozen rivers, lakes, and streams throughout the winter months in the, in the northwest, uh, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area and all through the American Desert Southwest, we're seeing those. The glyphs are, are not etched into the top of the ice or into the bottom. They're actually embedded in the inner layers of the ice, and they don't really last long. Uh, and even beyond that, uh, for the first time this last year, 1995, 
uh, I saw a phenomenon in northern New Mexico on a sandbar uh, in the Rio Grande River. Uh, this image that I'm going to show you was taken from a balloonist who was uh, at about 2,300 feet above the surface of the Earth. He lost air in his balloon quickly and dropped to about 200 feet. He, he believed that he was going to crash. And at 200 feet, he looked down onto this sandbar, and it happened to be on the day of the solstice, very close to high noon. And what he saw is this. You can see this spiral. This is a very, very uh, uh, particular, very specific kind of spiral that you will see often in the petroglyphs of the south, southwest, uh, in the traditions of, of the Hopi, the Navajo, many of the other indigenous people of that time. The spiral uh, of time, the spiral of life. And the interesting thing about this and the uh, um, this particular spiral is that it didn't last long. It was gone within just a few hours of the sandbar. Uh, the water receded, the glyph was exposed, and then uh, the glyph disappeared as, uh, and the water covered it up again. So we're seeing uh, uh, a phenomenon that if it is uh, not new has not been recorded much over the last few hundred years all these things are happening now within the last few years of the close of this cycle the close of this decade uh, this grand cycle of experience that began uh, uh, nearly 200,000 years ago why and what does it mean what does it mean to you and I again the continuity of the information and the context within which this information is offered are so important one additional phenomenon uh, that, uh, that I'd like to speak about uh, as we're moving into this information is something uh, called the photon belt. There's a lot of information, a lot of books out now. Uh, and people are talking about uh, the photon belt, what it means to us, what it means to our lives uh, as, as we're witnessing this, uh, uh, this phenomenon for which we have no reference point. We've never seen this happen before. Uh, essentially what the photon belt is, in 1961, an astronomer named Robert Stanley began to detect particles of light, increased numbers of these particles, in the atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, they were called photons. And they've been measured since 1961, and they have continued to increase in density. So what's happening is uh, we are, are moving into a, a band, if you will, of greater and greater density, greater and greater particles of light. Well, researchers now know that this band uh, is a band that our solar system runs into or, or actually passes through uh, once about every 26 to 27,000 years, somewhere right around in there, depending on, on which calendars we're, we're looking at. Uh, and that it takes our solar system about 2,000 years for us to pass from one edge to the other of this band. And at the 1,000 year point, we are in the center of the band, the densest portion of the light um, that this band, that this photon belt has to offer. Now, there are texts out there from their perspective that um, have offered a scenario that some people appears frightening. And there, there is, uh, uh, has been some concern about what it means to us, what it means to our lives as we pass into this photon belt. We're in the photon belt right now. And you're watching this video, I'm able to record this video, our material, our equipment is still functioning, uh, and we're in this photon belt. What I believe is happening uh, is that the interpretation of our time when we actually reach the midpoint of the photon belt, that time coincides very closely with a, a, a point in history that the ancients called the shift of the ages. And as we go through our magnetic models, and the models of, uh, of base resonant frequency of the Earth, you will see what those parameters mean to our lives, and you'll see how those parameters timed synchronistically with uh, the moving into the center of the photon belt, how they provide a, a very different and unique experience for us. Uh, I believe that this is a very healthy and a very natural process that we are moving into, uh, is a process not to be feared, to be welcomed, as this photon belt is offering to you and I a reference signal, a reference frequency of light. Uh, and that will make more sense and will refer back to this as we move through this body of information. The ancient calendars, uh, almost universally, the ancient calendars 
point to this decade, to this time in history, as being unique not only in human history, as we have known it for the last 200,000 years or so, uh, to Earth history, to geologic history as well. Um, almost universally, the calendars, the Chinese calendars, Tibetan calendars, uh, the Mayan calendars, the Egyptian calendars, that were developed thousands of years ago end in these days. They end in this time. And they all point to now as being a time that is very unique in history. Uh, this is an image of, uh, it's taken from the wall of the Temple of Dindara in Egypt. And uh, I know from where you are, it, it may not be uh, clear what this image is. I'll give you a, a schematic next. I'll show you a schematic drawing so you can actually see what we're looking at. This is the original zodiac uh, 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 calendar from this temple wall. This is where the original uh, patterns of the zodiac come from. This calendar, this Egyptian calendar, began nearly 39,000 years ago. Uh, 39,000 years ago, this calendar was developed, and it ends now in these days. The Mayan calendar, by some estimates over 18,000 years old, points to now, to this time in history. Uh, Jose Arguez, in his book, uh, The Mayan Factor, suspected that that Mayan calendar measures something much more than time, in addition to the passing of linear time. What the Mayan calendar says is that time, as you and I have always known it, actually ended in July of 1992. And between July of 1992 and December of the year 2012, you and I are experiencing the interface, a transition point between two kinds of time as they are defined by the light received upon the Earth. Tying back to the photon belt. During that time, the Mayans were so specific about this period in time that they even had a name for this time. They called it no time. And they said those who would live this interface period between the time that's always been and the time that is yet to be, those who would live this time would be living the time of no time. And that it would take a very, very powerful being, a, a, a very uh, special being, um, a being capable of remembering and focusing and holding the focus of the nature and the intent of their life purpose to live during this transition time. So the Mayan calendar, 18,000 years old, points to these days, to this time in history. Why are these calendars all pointing to now? What is the trigger that is allowing this shift, allowing a change of some kind to happen uh, according to these calendars as we know them now? Well, to really understand what this process is all about, all of the phenomenon, all of the unprecedented uh, um, and outrageous things that we're seeing happen for which there are no reference points, to really understand the continuity and the related nature of these events, I believe it is, uh, is key to begin to view the earth through the eyes uh, both of the ancient traditions and the language of our modern science. It's the marriage, the union of those traditions that allow us the understanding and the wisdom to move forward through this unprecedented uh, time in history. So as we, as we go to the Earth, uh, just for a, a few moments, this will look like uh, maybe like Science 101, just, just for a couple of moments. Uh, I'll ask you to consider this. You may have done this ex experiment uh, at some point when you were in school. Um, if you didn't, you can do it at home on your own. You can go to any hardware store, take a, a bar of iron, and wrap a conductor around that iron, copper wire, a certain direction, and pass electricity through that wire in one direction. And what will happen is the, the, uh, uh, the iron bar develops a phenomenon known as polarity that has a north and a south pole. Okay? When the electricity is shut off, the polarity goes away. It is the flow of electrons, now this is important, the flow of electrons in a circular fashion around the iron that produces the fields of the magnetics. Okay? Now, if you take that same iron bar with the same configuration and pass electricity in the opposite direction, okay, so we're just passing electricity in the opposite direction, electrons moving in a circular fashion around the iron in the opposite direction, we still have a north and a south pole. Look what's happened. The poles have reversed. What was once north becomes south, and what was once south 
becomes north. That concept is, is a beautiful metaphor for, for uh, precisely what is happening on Earth in our world right now. Until recently, when we looked at a cross-section of the Earth, we be believed that the Earth looked very similar to what, uh, what you're seeing here. This is a, a cutaway diagram uh, that was made back in the early 1990s, and we're seeing the crust as the blue portion, the, the thin layer of the crust on the Earth, uh, the thicker mantle, and the yellow and the red, the outer and the inner cores of the Earth. Within just the last few months, uh, what we've discovered is that even this image now is, is obsolete, as we've discovered that the center core of our Earth is not a sphere at all, that it is, uh, it is crystalline in nature, uh, following the form of a platonic solid, an ancient form that we know as the dodecahedron. It is approximately 98% iron. So if you'll think back to the, uh, the little uh, demonstration that we did just a few moments ago of the copper wire wrapped around the iron bar, electrons passing through that wire in a circular fashion around the iron generate the magnetic fields. Well, when I was studying geology to become a geologist back in uh, mid to uh, late 1970s, one of the big mysteries was where do these magnetic fields come from on the Earth? We knew they were there. Where did they come from? What uh, the ancient texts have told us and what we now know have been able to demonstrate the same metaphor as the electrons passing around the copper wire in the iron bar. Earth rotates. If you look at a model of the Earth, here's our Earth. Earth rotates about an axis. Okay, And in that rotation, what is happening is, to, to be very clear about the, the mechanism, is that the overall rotation is occurring and within that, the mantle inside the Earth rotates at a different speed, and the outer crust rotates at a different speed, and the inner crust, or the, I'm sorry, the inner core rotates at a different speed, and they are all rotating simultaneously at varying rates. In that rotation, what you have is essentially electrons moving around iron, the iron cores of the Earth. And it is this rotation of the Earth that generates the very powerful magnetic fields uh, that we're discussing now. So, uh, the uh, magnetic fields of the Earth are generated from the rotation of the Earth. There is something very interesting that is happening uh, with the magnetic fields of the Earth right now. Researchers have known for years that the faster the Earth rotates, the stronger the fields, and the slower the Earth rotates, the weaker the fields of the magnetics are. Okay? Now, that's important. Look at this. In this in this image, what you're seeing here, this uh, the red this red line is uh, a line of the magnetic fields of the Earth through time. Time is passing in this direction. Right here, this is the present time today. Now we're looking 2,000 years ago, and what we see is that 2,000 years ago the magnetic fields were at a peak. They were higher 2,000 years ago than they had been for a long, long time. And they were higher 2,000 years ago than they have been at any time since then. And what we can say is this. We can say that 2,000 years ago, Earth had the strongest, the densest magnetic fields. Earth was rotating faster 2,000 years ago, generating those stronger magnetic fields. And something began to happen. As you can see, the magnetic fields are dropping. Well, if the strength of those fields is tied to the rotation of the Earth, and the faster Earth rotates, the stronger the fields are. When you see low fields, what you are seeing is a decrease in the rotation of the Earth. And that's precisely what is happening. Earth right now is slowing down. It rotates slower and slower each year. Our researchers know this. Researchers know this. Um, they measure this. The National Bureau of Standards in Boulder, Colorado, every year, they must adjust the atomic clocks, the cesium-based clocks that keep track of our time. They have to adjust those clocks to compensate for the slowing of Earth's rotation. Now, admittedly, it's not very much that they have to do the adjustments. They're very, very small, incremental periods of time, and those periods of incremental time are cumulative. They add up over long periods of time. And the researchers actually say, they say that if we did not do that, by the end of this decade, what used to be noon would become midnight. That's how, how much of a change 
uh, those uh, the, the rotation has, uh, the effect that it has on our keeping of time. Well, if we're seeing this magnetic field decrease, what we're seeing is this, the slowing of the rotation of the Earth. So on our little board over here, I have you see uh, this red line represents the magnetic, the intensity of the magnetic fields of the Earth as time increases in this direction. Okay, so here's the magnetic fields on this scale here. Here is no magnetics, a zero point magnetic, and we're somewhere around in here. We're, we're losing, <coughs> excuse me, we're losing magnetics very, very quickly. Uh, the interesting thing is that it is not a linear drop. Researchers can't look at where the magnetics were 50 years ago and then look at where they are five years ago and draw a straight line and say that's where they're going to be five years from now. It is not a linear function. It is a geometric function. I hope that's an erasable pin that we have on here. It's a geometric drop that we're seeing uh, on these magnetic fields. So you say, well, how much are these fields actually dropping? Right now, we're experiencing about 50% less magnetics in our planet than we did only 1,500 years ago, 50% less. And it appears that we're losing around 5 to 6, maybe 8% of the magnetic field every 100 years up until fairly recently, and now we're losing even more. It's happening quicker. So what we can say is the more that the fields drop, the faster they drop. Uh, through mutual friends, I had the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to talk about this information with someone from the, the GeoMonitor uh, organization. Uh, they keep track of things like this, this kind of information, magnetics, frequency, and such. And, uh, and they said, yes, in fact, the Earth's magnetics are dropping very quickly. And they said two very interesting things that I'll, I'll share with you now. First thing they said was that any time in recorded history that Earth's magnetics have dropped to this degree, it has always been a precursor to a 180-degree polar reversal. So the North Pole becoming the South and the South Pole becoming the North. You'll see the mechanism for that in just a moment. And the second thing that they said, I think is really interesting, what they said is this. If someone asked them how low the magnetics of Earth are actually right now, what the GeoMonitor people said was this. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest readings, the strongest magnetics, right now, 19, early 1996, Earth is between a 1 and a 1.5 on this scale. That is how low the fields are in a relative sense. And they're continuing to drop. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about this uh, is that this is not new. Earth's dropping of the magnetic fields is not a new phenomenon. Uh, I have uh, in, a drawing here. It comes, it's a text uh, page right out of the textbook, so it, it's a little difficult to see. Uh, and what I'll point out to you is this. This is a time scale. Present time is at the top ancient time is at the bottom, this scale represents 4.5 million years. 4.5 million years. And what we're seeing here, the, the two uh, columns that I'll call your attention to, is this column right here, of these little boxes, and then right next to it, this column right here. And what these columns represent, each of these blocks represents a, a period of geologic time when Earth was oriented either north-south the way we know it now or, or north-south reversed. So for example, this block right here represents uh, a long period of time when the north and south poles of the Earth were identical to what we know now. And this is another time when they were identical and look how short this period of time is. This column represents periods of geologic time when our north and south poles were just the opposite of what we are right now. So what you see is that many times throughout Earth's history, this is why I'm showing you this slide, many times throughout Earth's history, Earth has gone through a 180 degree magnetic polar reversal. We see at least 14 times in the last 4.5 million years right here that we have had this polar reversal. Uh, the most recent that we're aware of through the geologic evidence uh, appears to be between 11 and 13,000 years ago, uh, right around in there. It coincides 
very well with uh, Plato's accounts of the, the sinking of Atlantis and uh, um, the, the biblical flood and some of the geologic evidence that we see in, the, in Egypt and the Middle East. Ancient texts, however, indicate that we may have experienced one of these polar reversals as recently as 35 to 3600 years ago. 3,500 to 3,600 years ago. Um, the traditions and the prophecies of, of many of the indigenous peoples uh, seem to indicate that. 3,500 years ago is not long enough to find in a geologic record. So we, we wouldn't expect to see it in a rock record. Where we do see evidence of this is in the ice records, in the Greenland ice caps, in the Antarctic ice caps, as we're taking... Um, measurements of oxygen and, uh, and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere caught in little bubbles. Something was happening 35 or 3600 years ago. It also uh, coincides very nicely to, uh, to Zechariah Sitchin's work uh, through his book The Twelfth Planet and many of the, uh, the catastrophic events that, uh, that he has indicated. So we may have experienced in our world a 180 degree magnetic reversal as, as little as 3500 years ago. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this has never happened with 6.5 billion people living on the planet. And it appears that you and I are living the precursive days, the precursive experiences to precisely this experience and more. Now watch this. This is the magnetic field. And what I ask you to remember from this is simply that as the magnetic fields drop, the faster they drop, the more they drop, and we appear to be moving toward a point where we have no magnetics, zero point magnetics, zero point magnetics. Now, at the same time, there is another parameter that is unfolding uh, within our experience right now, and it is simply called uh, base resonant frequency. It's a fundamental vibration. It's a fundamental heartbeat of the Earth. Every time the Earth pulses, every one second of our experience when the earth pulses electromagnetically that pulse traditionally historically has been a certain number of beats per second or cycles per second or hertz as the term is called uh, traditionally that number has been about 7.8 this number was first measured directly back in 1899 and 1900 uh, and all the way through the early part of this century through the 20s and the 30s throughout uh, World War I World War II all up in the 1950s uh, as late as the early 1980s this number held constant approximately 7.8 cycles per second it is such a constant that uh, it, actually 1958 there was a, a meeting of uh, a global meeting of technological countries that agreed uh, from 1958 on not to publish the base resonant frequency of the earth not to publish that information because it became a fundamental uh, communications frequency and, and later was, um, was key in new weapon systems, electromagnetic weapon systems, based on this fundamental heartbeat of the Earth. That was the IGY, the International Geophysical Year. Well, we believed up until recently that this number 7.8 was, uh, was a constant, that every second that we experience that Earth pulses a certain number of times. Well, something interesting began to happen in the uh, again in the mid to late 1980s what we see is this there's 7.0 here's 8 7.8 all the way through 1970s 1980 in the mid to late 1980s 86 87 right around in there that number began to increase mysteriously and it went from 7.8 to 8 to 8.23 to 8.6 at the end of 1995 the number was validated at 8.6 cycles per second in just a few years. It had been a constant throughout the time that we had been measuring uh, this parameter. Now in early 1996, researchers are reporting numbers as high as nine cycles per second. But while I have not seen that directly, those are the reports that are coming in. And I wouldn't be surprised because, as you can see on our little chart here, this green, uh, the green line that we have drawn, this is the representation of this fundamental heartbeat of the base resonant frequency or the human frequency of the earth. This is frequency. And by the way, if you'd like to look this up in the open literature, uh, this is under Schumann cavity resonance, S-C-H-U-M-A-N-N, 
Uh, if you do a word search on that at the library, you'll get about 250 references for a musician named Schumann. Go to the bottom of those, and if there are any references for uh, uh, the Schumann, for the Schumann frequency, that's where you'll find them. So here's what we're seeing. Here, again, time is in, moving in this direction, and our frequency increase is on this scale over here. What we're seeing is this, that as we move forward in time, this vibration is increasing, and again, it's nonlinear. The more it increases, the faster it increases. Now, there's something interesting about, uh, about the way that that frequency appears to be governed uh, in our lives. There's a series of numbers. Uh, if you've studied the science of sacred geometry, I know you're very familiar with these numbers. Uh, if you've been to any of our workshops, you've seen them. It is called the Fibonacci or Fibonacci, F-I-B-O-N-A-C-C-I. -C -C -I. Fibonacci series of numbers. It is a, a sequence that, that begins like this. These are the first 12 elements of the sequence. One, one, two, three, five, eight, eight. Uh, vibration is increasing, and again, it's nonlinear. The more it increases, the faster it increases. Now, there's something interesting about uh, about the way that that frequency appears to be governed uh, in our lives. There's a series of numbers. Uh, if you've studied the science of sacred geometry, I know you're very familiar with these numbers. Uh, if you've been to any of our workshops, you've seen them. It is B-O-N-A-C-C-I. Fibonacci series of numbers. It is a, a sequence that, that begins like this. These are the first 12 elements of the sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 8, uh, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144. Any element is derived by taking the sum of the previous two elements. 1 plus 1 or 2, 2 plus 1 or 3, 3 plus 2 or 5. This is a, a key, a fundamental code in governing the way that life expresses in our world. In your body, for example, if you're to measure the tip of any finger in your hand to that first joint, you will get a number, and so will the person sitting next to you, and if you take from that tip to the next joint, you'll get another number, and so will the person next to you, and the numbers will all be different. If you divide uh, one number into the next, if you divide the big number into the little number, what you will get, even though the numbers are all different, the ratio between the two numbers will be the same. It happens with this series of numbers. If you divide 8 into 5 or 3 into 2, and that ratio looks like this, 0.618. We call it the golden ratio, the golden mean. It appears to be such a powerful uh, series of numbers governing not only the proportions of the human body and, and the way our eyes are set in our head and the, the heights of our ears and where our, our nose is from the top of our lips, how large our lungs are, where the navel is in proportion to the rest of the body, how a finger knows to be a little finger instead of a, a thumb or, or an index finger. This series of numbers governs the branching patterns on trees, uh, the root systems on plants, the way that water forks and branches as it moves downhill, the way that lightning branches, if, if you see a, um, finger lightning as it moves through the sky, those dendritic patterns are all governed by this series of numbers and it appears that this series of numbers also governs the fundamental heartbeat of our Earth. So historically, Earth has hovered around eight cycles per second, 7.8 just under eight cycles per second. We are moving quickly now beyond that. Researchers now suspect that we're moving to the next element in this series that governs the heartbeat of the Earth, the lucky number 13, 13 cycles per second, right here. Now this is important, this is important to you. Here's the reason why. What I have just done is I've given you now two digitally measurable parameters of the Earth these are the parameters now that dictate much of our experience in terms of cellular, genetic, and emotional response to what we call life. They are governed by this, this series of numbers. Now, what we're seeing happening is this. With just this information now, you have enough information uh, for yourself that you are able to develop a context within which all of the other things that we will do in these next few hours, all of the events of your life, are unfolding within the context of these parameters. And let me show you why this is important to you. What we're seeing is this. The magnetics are falling quickly, uh, apparently moving toward a, a time of zero-point magnetics. No magnetics on Earth. 
Frequency is increasing quickly, apparently moving toward or possibly reaching a threshold fundamental resonance of 13 cycles per second, 13 hertz. The day that that happens, the day that these two parameters become very, very close, possibly meeting, that point, that innocent looking little point right there, that's the day that every belief system that I'm aware of, that I've ever studied, every religion, all of the, the sacred orders and the mystery schools and the sacred sects, the sect of the, of the Rosicrucians, the sect of the, uh, the, the, uh, the Red Hand, the uh, Amethystine orders, the Emerald orders, the Order of the Holy Grail, the Melchizedek orders, the Essene traditions, the Egyptian mystery schools, the uh, Peruvian uh, mystery schools, they are all, uh, the Christian traditions, they are all based uh, upon the, the ideas and the concepts of what you and I must do in our lives to prepare our bodies and our emotions to gracefully allow us to transition through this day in human history that the ancients called the shift of the ages. And I'll call it the shift from this point forward. That's what this point is all about. Some people call this the New Age. From this point forward, that is the time that they will call, they will reference as the New Age. Some people call this the Christing process, the Christing of Earth. Um, there are so many terms out there that were meaningless, I thought I would just add one more to it and call it zero point. Zero point experience. From the Hopi tradition, the Hopis say that we have lived in five previous worlds, this being uh, the fifth that we're in right now, and that in each of these worlds, there has come a time when our mind and our heart has become so separate, the, the connection, the relationship between our minds and our hearts have become so dissonant that there was, there was no way to find the healing. And Earth goes through a time of purification to allow that healing process again. So from the Hopi perspective, we are now approaching uh, the time of, of the sixth world of the Hopi. Uh, other indigenous people say that we've lived in a dream for thousands of years and that when we go to sleep at night, we live a dream within a dream and that on this day, our dream changes. It's a new dream from that point forward. This point provides the context within which uh, all the rest of the information will unfold as we go through uh, these next few hours, this zero point. Now, let's summarize what we've just done here because we covered a lot of information in, in a, uh, just a few seconds, a few, few moments of time. What we see is this. This is our Earth, a schematic, a cross-section schematic of the Earth. And the Earth rotates about an iron core. As Earth rotates, and remember, it's, it's not only the Earth as we see it externally, it's all of the inner cores are rotating at the same time. As the Earth rotates around these cores, it generates magnetic fields. Okay? The faster the Earth rotates, the denser, the stronger the fields. The slower it rotates, the weaker the fields. Well, Earth is in the process right now. Our rotation is slowing down. Earth is slowing down. And as it does so, these fields become weaker and weaker until the point that the fields collapse to zero. Okay? Now, I have to tell you, as a geologist, this, an ex-geologist, this, to me, is an outrageous thing for me to say to you. When I first began to understand this, I said, there is no way. And this little voice in my head would say, way. And I'd say, no way. And they'd say, way. Because it has happened before. And now, as we're able to go back into the history, uh, the written text and the, the, the non-written text, the geologic text of, of our world, we see very clear evidence that this, in fact, has happened. That Earth, every once in a while, slows a rotation to a point where there is a rest period. There is no rotation. And it rests for a brief period of time and begins to increase the rotation again. And as it does so, it rotates in the opposite direction. And again, as a geologist, when I first began to understand that, I said, that's just outrageous. And the more I researched, the more uh, I read, the more I, I went back and looked at the ancient text, we see that uh, it, in fact, has happened at least once that we're able to record, uh, we're able to discern in recorded history. Uh, 
when I was in school, I was taught that if Earth ever stopped rotating, there would be no gravity. And I get that question all the time. People say, well, what, what about gravity? Uh, if there's no rotation, does that mean everything flies off, off the, the planet? And I remember there were textbooks uh, when I was in school that showed just that. They said if ever Earth would stop rotating, uh, everybody would fly off. And they had these pictures of people that were, <laughs> that were like this. Uh, everybody was having a, a bad hair day the day that the, that the, the Earth stops rotating. Uh, and we now know that that is simply not the case, that Earth's gravity is not a function of the rotation. Without rotation at all, Earth still has gravity. When we send astronauts into space, uh, and they are weightless in space, and we, we propel their craft in a rotational fashion, so that they are able to stay on the sides of their capsule. That's not really gravity. What that is is a centrifugal force that is throwing everything out to the sides of the craft so that they are uh, able to, to uh, simulate gravity. That is not true gravity. Uh, so what I'm saying to you is that whether Earth rotates or not uh, is irrelevant in terms of the gravity of the Earth. We uh, have records. If, if this were to happen in recorded human history, I would certainly expect that it would have been, uh, someone would have noticed it and we would see it in our texts. And in fact, we do. Uh, we have at least one time, about 3,500 years ago, th there's that number again. Um, now think about this. If Earth were ever to stop rotating on its axis, come to a rest, portion, some portion of the Earth toward the sun would become very warm and another portion would probably be very cool during the time that the rotation stopped. And that's precisely what we see in these texts. We see recorded in the Peruvian texts um, the, the long night that lasted almost three days. And at the same time, on the other side of the earth, right here in the Middle East, what we see are the biblical records of a long day that was uh, over 20 hours long. The Hopi record a day where the sun rose twice in the same day. Now think about that. They call it the long day where the sun rose once in the, e in the east and uh, rose once in the west and set in the east. And later that day, the long day, 20 hours later, rose again in the east and set in the west as it continues to do today. So it may be that we have very uh, good records, uh, if we have the wisdom to recognize them, of, uh, of exactly this process happening at least once at some point in, uh, in recorded Earth history. This time, this time that we're talking about, the shift of the ages, you now have the parameters that are defining what this time means to us now. You and I probably are living the days, the precursive days, toward an event very similar to something like this. And the reality is that those inner cores will probably stop rotating long before the outer cores do, and you and I may not recognize this rotational shift quite the same way that we would expect to in day in and day out in the, in the normal sequence of our lives. And you'll, ex you'll understand, and I will explain that much better as we, as we go through this information. This is such a powerful body of information to understand and to recognize what these parameters mean in our lives. But we're gonna come back to our drawings here in just a few moments. Uh, what I'll ask you to do is to simply remember this process of decreasing magnetics and increasing frequency. Hold that thought just for a moment. Uh, I have another drawing here. This is what's called it's a very simple phase diagram for you engineers. Uh, it's a phase diagram. I chose water, H2O, showing the different ways that water may express itself under different conditions. And, and you know these conditions, and that's why I chose this, so you could see these. Now this is temperature moving in this direction, increasing in this direction, and this is atmospheric pressure increasing in this direction right here. So what we can say is under certain temperatures and certain pressures, water within this dark line, water exists as a solid, as ice. Under a whole range of pressures right here and under a, under a narrow range of temperatures right here. Under other under, excuse me, other temperatures and pressures, water expresses as a liquid between this line and this line right here. And under other conditions, it expresses as a gas. Chemically, it's still water. It's H2O. Structurally, it's expressing very differently. It's going through what we call a phase transition or a change of state. 
And I have shown this to you because I believe it's a beautiful metaphor for precisely what you and I are experiencing on Earth right now. I believe that Earth is going through a phase transition. Uh, instead of temperature and pressure, what we're dealing with are magnetics and frequency over time. As uh, in our phase diagram, as temperature and pressure change, H2O continues to be H2O and crystallizes differently as you and I and our Earth undergo a, a transition, a change of state of magnetics and frequency, we remain carbon-based beings. We remain in physical bodies, and our physical bodies are, uh, are going through a change of state, a crystalline change of transition. That, I believe, is the essence of the experience that, uh, that we are, are uh, asking ourselves to assimilate at this time. That change of state, that transition, is the essence of what every belief system, every religion, and scientific doctrine that I, uh, I'm aware of that I've ever studied is based upon. This is a beautiful image from uh, the artist Alex Gray out of his book Sacred Mirrors. And what he's showing is th this form of the human body. This body can be nothing more than the elements. It's superimposed upon that table. The body can be nothing more than some combination of the elements, the very elements that we find in Earth. That's all these bodies are. They are different arrangements of all of these elements that we see right here. It's amazing when I take people on a sacred journey to um, um, Peru, for example, or to Egypt. And we go in Peru, we go to the Yorubamba River, and we reach down and we pick up a handful of that sand. And it feels good. People like to feel that. And I say, it should feel good to you because that's you. That sand, the elements and the minerals that you're holding in your hand, they are you, different ratios, different proportions and combinations. That's what you are. So all that we may be are the elements that we find here on our Earth. Our Earth is going through a phase transition. It's changing. We are asking ourselves to allow the gift of that transition as it unfolds within our bodies. Uh, this image, this particular image I chose, it's a beautiful image out of the first page of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The Dead and the Living, as it's now being called. Uh, and what you're seeing is in the center is an image of Buddha expressed as, uh, as a being. And leading up to, these are all these concentric circles are all the experiences that a human must move through to achieve this Buddha state. Now, the interesting thing is this, that Buddha is shown in the Buddha state. And look at this. All the experiences are given to us as vibratory codes, patterns of vibration that must be achieved before we reach this state. That will be important in just a moment. I'm going to show you so that you may see with your own eyes uh, the relationship between vibration and matter and the way that matter expresses within given parameters, within a, a given environment. Now, another reason I showed you this image is because in the tradition, uh, uh, traditional Tibetan scriptures, if I may use that term, uh, there is a path that is outlined, it is a path uh, of choice where somewhere in the life of a human, uh, a mysterious force that we call the soul may have the opportunity to leave the physical body, as we've, we've just defined it, and transition to another state of experience. We call that transition death. And the, uh, the Tibetan book of the living and the dead uh, give, go into tremendous details about coaching the soul through the transition of that death. So, so this is the Tibetan tradition. Uh, the Egyptian tradition shows something very similar. This is uh, an image of the, the goddess Newt. Step back so you can see. This is the head of Newt. This is Newt's body. And if you could see uh, her feet and the rest of, of her body on the other side, what you would see is that the sun, the red dots of the sun, are birthed through the womb of Newt and go through the world of men, daylight, until they reach the other side and Newt swallows the sun again and we go into darkness and the sun passes through her body and completes the cycle over and over again. Through this tradition, uh, this is a code that was left in the mystery schools in, in the Egyptian uh, temples, we live this cycle 
of light and dark in every breath that we inhale and exhale, in every day of our lives as those days pass through our lives. And they also make a distinction that at some point within, uh, within the lifetime of each human, we will have the opportunity to, to make this transition where the life force or the soul leaves the body the body returns to, to those elements that it came from, just like you saw in Alex Gray's drawing, and the soul moves on into a new expression of itself, a, a very different experience. Okay, This is another image now, a very similar image in the Christian traditions, the Christian mystery schools, showing the same thing, showing the distinction between a, a dark world uh, below, uh, a lighter world in heaven, and a time in between those worlds, the time of our lives right now, as we walk in between these worlds. Uh, and the distinction is made between the time that we are here and to get to either here or here, the soul leaves the body. Okay, now, I'm making that distinction because it is a path. The, the opportunity for the soul to leave the body and to transition into a, a higher form of experience is a path it is not the only path. Okay? So I'm going to make a distinction between the Egyptian, the Tibetan, uh, and the uh, uh, traditional Christian traditions. And, and the mystery schools are saying something very different. Um, between these traditions and, uh, and the mystery schools, as we'll show them to you. So again, this is one of Alex Gray's drawing, beautiful draw drawings. This is a, a beautiful image of that moment where the soul transitions from the physical body. The physical body is left to deteriorate. It is the vibratory pattern of the soul, the will that holds these elements together, allowing this body to be what the body is. So through those traditions, what we are conditioned to believe is at some point in our lives, the, the essence of our being transitions from the physical body into another form of experience existence. And this body returns to the elements from which it was borrowed, back to the earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That is a path. That is our conditioning in the Western world, and that is a choice. And now I'm going to draw a distinction and show you the choice and what that choice means in terms of all of the technical things that we have, have been uh, discussing here in the last few minutes. Through the mystery schools, we are given another path, another opportunity for the body to express differently through life. Um, these are, I just took some random um, passages out of uh, acre, uh, sorry, ancient and sacred texts from the mystery schools just to give you some idea of why context is so important. I'm going to read some of these to you. You may not be able to read them well on your own screen. I'll read them to you. And bear in mind that without context, what we're reading here makes very little sense to any of us. Uh, our biblical texts say this. They say, Lo, I tell you a mystery in those days. They're talking about the shift of the ages. In those days, we shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean, that change? Without context, it doesn't make much sense at all. Uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, a fascinating body of information. It's not channeled. It was actually written and recorded uh, approximately 13 thousand years ago. It's actually pre-Egyptian texts. This book, the Emerald Tablets, became, uh, and it remains today, essentially the Bible of the Freemasons, the Masonic traditions, um, the homeopathic sciences, as above, so below, and like treats like. Those all come from this text of, the, uh, of Thoth, uh, the Egyptian master in the Emerald Tablets. And look what Thoth says. He says that man is a man, human, not making a distinction between male and female, but the form of man is in the process of changing to forms of light that are not of this world. Now, we hear that all the time today from all the channel material and all the books and the workshops that are out there. 13,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, this is a pretty outrageous thing for anyone to say, that we were changing into forms of light. Now, uh, two passages from the, uh, the Book of Mormon. These are a couple of my favorites. Uh, it says that in those days, in the, the days of uh, the shift of the ages, that you shall never, I'm sorry, that you shall never endure the pains of death when I come in my glory, speaking of uh, the universal reference beings, ye shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality. And it goes on to say that it is in our bodies 
that we will see our Creator, in our bodies that we'll see God. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with religion, although it is taken from what may be considered religious texts. This is ancient information of a phase transition within the human body, information that was left to us that does not make a lot of sense uh, in the past without the context within which to frame this transition. The ancient Essenes, uh, I identify very closely with the traditions uh, of the Essenes. The Essenes were um, uh, a sect of individuals who separated themselves from others of their time so that they, they could live um, their traditions and their belief systems in the way that they felt uh, was appropriate. And in the Essene traditions, uh, we're given a much different story uh, in terms of our history, our purpose, our lives in this world, and this phase transition that Earth and our bodies are going through uh, in this moment. We'll give that transition a name in just a few minutes. So through the Essene traditions, mu much of this information, many of these uh, traditions, are found in the scrolls uh, that were uh, found in the Qumran area uh, around the Dead Sea. They became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're certainly not limited to the Dead Sea Scrolls. We see the uh, Essene traditions throughout the Tibetan texts, uh, throughout the, uh, the Egyptian texts, in the Ethiopian traditions, uh, in the Armenian traditions. They are scattered throughout our ancient texts if we have the wisdom to see them. And there is a, a, a universal thread that runs through those traditions. Okay. Uh, in the traditions of the Essenes, through the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, and many of the other texts, what we find is, uh, is this. We find that all of the, the biblical books in the Old Testament are verified in those Dead Sea Scrolls and more that we have not seen. And what it appears is, is happened, and what we know from, uh, from our history, is that somewhere around the year 325 A.D., somewhere right around in there, uh, what we call our biblical text was revamped. Many books were deleted. Those that were left were compressed uh, into a, uh, a, a smaller form. Some of the books that were taken out uh, of our text remain in the Dead Sea Scrolls, remain in the Nag Hammadi Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi texts, also discovered in, uh, in 1947, in the uh, Tibetan texts. Look at what some of these books are all about. This is fascinating information. Um, uh, the Gospel of the Birth of Mary. This is a beautiful uh, body of information that, that details the life of Mary uh, Mary's mother, for example, 81 years old when she gave birth to, uh, to the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. And, um, and Mary's mother had been barren for those 81 years, had never given, given birth to anyone else. Uh, Mary was 14 years old when she married her husband Joseph. All that information, the Essene mystery schools played a key role in these women's lives as they were Essene initiates. Uh, the books of visions of the prophets, uh, the letters of Herod and Pilate, uh, this is an especially interesting book uh, between these two men. Uh, the letters were written immediately following the crucifixion of Christ. And, and the letters go something like this. Pilate wrote a letter to Herod, uh, who was the, the king at that time, and said, I think we just made a mistake in this execution. And, and Herod wrote a letter back to Pilate and said, what do you mean we? Why do you say we made a mistake? You were the one that, uh, that made that choice. And Pilate writes back and says, well, uh, I didn't really want him killed. It was uh, the people of, of the village, and it goes on from there. It gives us a very different view of uh, the life of the Essenes, of the, uh, the thought processes surrounding this execution. Uh, the Secrets of the Book of Enoch. This is one of the reasons I put this in here. The Book of Enoch is, is a beautiful book of mysteries. The prophet Enoch, taken from his time ahead of our time to see uh, what our world would be like, taken back to his time, recording that information and passing it down to us so that we would have a map of what this time in our history looks like. The Book of Enoch, uh, portions of it are so detailed they actually become actually a little boring uh, as we go through this, as they give day-by-day -day accounts of the change of the cycles of the moon and change of the cycles of the sun and the magnetic fields, the Ill earth tilting on its axis is actually what it says in this book of Enoch. Those are books uh, that we no longer have in our biblical text and that have a tremendous bearing on this time in history and this time uh, in our lives. Well, through these Essene traditions, we are given insights into the life of a man, a, a reference being, and I say that very intentionally, 
a man who came as a human to live among humans to learn what humans had learned, a man we now know is, is Jesus of Nazareth. And as I'm saying this, uh, what I'll say to you now on the camera, it may be no accident that this is being videoed on this day. This is Easter Sunday, 1996. And everyone here in the studio now is smiling uh, because we're actually filming this on, on Easter Sunday. Maybe no accident that uh, that, that is happening. That uh, that this this initiate, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, lived the life uh, that you and I have learned to live. He learned a trade. He lived. Our archaeological uh, records now are showing that the, the little village that he lived in wasn't so little at all. It was a booming metropolis of about forty thousand people. He learned of commerce. He had to do everything that you are learning to do in your life. He had to master the emotions of his life in order to proceed through the choices that he was making in his life. I love, uh, particularly love this image of Jesus as an initiate, as a student learning. This is again from Cheryl Yonbrock Rose. Uh, uh, the, the title of this image is, is Christ Anchoring the, the Celtic Ray uh, in, the, um, uh, in England. This is one of the sacred sites in, in England. So through the Essene traditions, what we are shown, what we are told is this, that at least once, one man, Jesus of Nazareth, remembered the true nature of his being, the nature of compassion, and we'll define that compassion that that is incomplete. Because the brain responds to a pulse, an electromagnetic signal, and that is how it regulates these cells. Where does that signal come from? Well, researchers uh, asked the same question, and, and just about two years ago, the 1994, 93, 94, what researchers discovered was that the brain does in fact have a signal and it responds and directs the signal, uh, receives a signal directly from the human heart. That there is actually a circuit, a, a resonant tuning between the human heart and the brain and the cells of our body. And it didn't take researchers long to say, well, if that's true, where does the heart get its signal? And this isn't the heartbeat. We're not talking about the heartbeat. We're talking about the electromagnetic pulse of the heart that you would get in an uh, EKG, for example. Well, it didn't take researchers long to discover that the Earth is, in fact, tuned to something else. The Earth receives its signals from something else directly from the Earth. So what we can say is uh, that there is a circuit that moves from the Earth to the heart, to the brain, to the cells of our body, a tuned resonant circuit. It's not about wires connecting things together. It's a vibratory tuning. And this system that we have is a system that is ongoing. Anytime there's a change anywhere in this system, everything from that point down must change. So look at what's happening right now. We just defined the changes the Earth is going through, magnetic changes, frequency changes, Everything down in the system must respond and accommodate that change. Your heart must accommodate that change to successfully transition. So what we say is that the earth entrains the heart, and the heart entrains the brain, and the brain entrains the cells. This is the sacred circuit. So another view of the circuit looks like this, because the circuit goes on from our earth. Here's the cells of your body. There's your brain, your heart. Your heart is tuned to the Earth. Well, where does the Earth get its signals? From our nearest star, our sun. Remember in the very beginning of our talk, we said that our sun is going through a tremendous transition right now. It's losing magnetics, uh, going to steady state magnetics. Well, if Earth is tuned to our sun, I would expect that Earth would follow suit. And what are researchers telling us about Earth? Earth is indeed losing the magnetics. Our star is tuned to something, whatever that energy source is, at the center of our Milky Way. The very first slide, uh, second slide, we saw that at that center, uh, the, the great central sun, as the ancients called it, the center of the Milky Way, that signal changed in 1991. We began to pick up a new signal that is cascading down through this resonant circuit. So from this very simple diagram, from this conceptual model, you can see that truly the cells of your body, you are truly part of all that you see, resonantly tuned to your world. And you ask yourself, if we have this resonance, if we are always tuned to our world, then why aren't we always tuned to our world? Why, why aren't we always tuned to the Earth as the Earth goes through the shifts that Earth is going through? And a very good question, and that is the, it's the crux of where we go from this point forward 
Because you and I have the luxury, we have the opportunity of emotion in our lives and different components of emotion either uh, enable or disable or impede the body's ability to maintain its tuning to the earth. Fear. Fear is a, a powerful ally in the experience of human expression. Fear is also uh, a very powerful uh, discordant frequency that disallows the tuning of the human body to the earth. And fear in our culture, fear has many masks. Now here is our tuned resonant circuit again. Here's the cells, the brain, the, uh, the heart, the earth. Traditionally, now admittedly this is changing right now within the last few years. Traditionally this is what we've done. Between our heart and, uh, and our brain, we have cut ourselves off. We've separated uh, mind knowing from heart knowing in our world. And the ancients have told us, the indigenous peoples have said for years, love your earth, love your home. That's the key to harmony in your world. To a 20th century uh, male-oriented, schematically diagrammed Western technological society, that doesn't mean much when you say love your earth. Now, as we're able to establish this resonant relationship, we know what that's saying. And the same thing happens uh, between the heart and the brain. Historically, we have cut ourselves off from, uh, um, from our planet and from our brain simply through our life patterns and, uh, and choices of lifestyle and the way that we've chosen to live. And that is changing now as we remember, as we heal this circuit, we heal the process. Fear is the only pattern that I'm aware of, the interference pattern that prevents whole earth, heart, brain, cell resonance. And in our culture, fear has many masks. Now, I placed this image here uh, not knowing how it would come out uh, across the video. We'll try this and we'll see. Well, this is an experiment that was done at Bell Labs in New Jersey, and it's kind of interesting. Down below what you see are 200 blocks. It's a combination uh, of 200 blocks of black, white, and gray that are randomly organized, and that's what that is. Up above, when I ask people what they are seeing in this arrangement, this array of these same 200 blocks just arranged differently, more often than not, what they'll say is a man, and then they are even specific enough to say Abraham Lincoln in some cases. Well, this isn't Abraham Lincoln at all. And if I take this image, I've done this, taking it to a country where men do not grow facial hair and where they've never heard of Abraham Lincoln, they won't see a man here at all. We see it in this country. And the reason that we see that is the reason that I'm showing it to you here. Because your brain attempts to make sense out of all the information that comes to it. And when it finds something it cannot recognize, it finds the next best pattern, the closest thing that it knows to assign meaning to that pattern. So this is an example of how we do this with our brain and with our eyes. You and I do precisely the same thing through emotion and feeling. We generalize patterns of feeling. Fear has many, many masks in our society. It's not always Stephen King, pure, unadulterated, shake in your boots, fear. If you are able to use any or, or uh, any combination of these terms to describe some relationship in your life, anger, um, jealousy, egos, uh, aggressiveness, control, um, overprotective, smothering, trust issues, uh, depression, uh, emotional unava unavailability, physical unavailability, prejudice, unhappiness, uh, judgment. If you're able to use any or some combination of those words, what you're describing to yourself in the honesty of, of that description is that you are experiencing fear in that relationship. And it's not bad. I'll be very clear. It is not bad to experience fear. What we are choosing to do is redefine the patterns of fear in our lives so that they may become our friends and our tremendous allies, indicating to us the portions of ourselves, of this liquid crystal matrix, that have not found balance in our world as we're barreling down this road toward what the ancients called the shift of the ages. It is through the gift of fear and the redefinition of that fear that we know ourselves and that we know ourselves in all ways. Fear, uh, as it expresses many ways in our lives. What I can say to you is this, that for most of you, for most people, 
90% of the fears that you will experience in your world are not even your fears. You'll go through three quarters, maybe a full lifetime, coming to terms and recognizing that those patterns are, are, are not yours. You may lose entire relationships. You may lose careers in the process of the remembering. The fears are not yours. You were born plugged in to predetermined patterns of fear. And I'm going to show you that. I'll show you genetically precisely how it happens in this lifetime, in this last lifetime of maturity before the shift of the ages. What you're being asked to do is to unplug from those old patterns, to break the cycle, to create the paradigm where those fears do not mean the same thing to you any longer. That is your gift of the living bridge to those that you hold most dear in your life. It's done through these codes, the patterns of genetics and DNA within your bodies. Now, when you look at, uh, at life, this is a standard definition, uh, our, uh, our standard definition of, of life. It's interesting. Uh, this came up from a chemical textbook. Life is a behavior pattern that chemical systems exhibit when they reach a certain level of complexity. That definition is what was behind our mission to Mars in 1976 as we were looking for biological life. What I, I really believe we were looking for was consciousness and not life necessarily. In this narrow definition, we sent this spindly looking little craft to the surface of Mars and it, uh, the rickety things sort of settled in, the, in a, a cloud of dust on the surface of the planet. Uh, it was built by a company that I proudly say I used to work for, Martin Marietta Aerospace. They build very good interplanetary probes. And I always have this image when I think about uh, uh, the Viking mission looking for life on Mars. If I were sitting there seeing this cloud of dust and, and this, this rickety thing coming down, it looked like a big spider, onto the surface, and all the dust settles out, and all of a sudden a little tube pops up. And from that tube, a little arm comes up and directs itself into a certain position and it's silent and all of a sudden there's a pop and this thing that looks like dental floss with a weight on the end of it shoots across the Martian surface and then they reel it back in and the sticky stuff on the string is holding the microbes uh, as the string is, is drawn down through a media and the idea was that if there was life on Mars uh, that would show up as a, as a culture in this media and send that information back to Earth and we would say ah there's life on another planet not knowing that within a few miles of where they were looking for biological life, there were archaeological remnants between 50 and 100,000 years old, reaching uh, 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 two miles long and resembling very closely many of the archaeological sites here on Earth. Well, this was our definition of life, and we didn't find any life on Mars uh, biologically, so we say there is no life there. Well, when we de define that life, what we say is it takes six components, water, uh, fats, lipids, proteins, salts, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids to create the life as we know life on Earth. And it's the nucleic acids that we'll focus on. Uh, DNA, everyone knows about DNA now because of the O.J. Simpson trial. If nothing else, everybody knows what DNA is all about. What we can say uh, essentially is that DNA makes RNA, RNA makes proteins, and proteins allow the amino acids in our bodies to be what they are. And that all sounds very technical, and what I'll say is you do not have to know any of that I'm going to offer this from a very different perspective. Now think about this. The reason I put this slide here is so that you can see each of these amino acids, this one here, uh, this one here, this one here, as the amino acids are different, they have a different form, a different geometry, a different shape. I think you can see that. And this is a, a, a close-up of more of those amino acids. Notice how uh, this is alanine, for example. It looks like a, a lollipop. Uh, and here we have aspartic acid. Looks like a Y with an extension on, excuse me, on the bottom of it. Uh, each of these amino acids has a very specific form. It's a pattern. It's a shape. And what I'll ask you to do is to simply consider these as micro antenna, micro antenna, micro chakras, because that is, uh, from a metaphoric perspective, that's precisely the role that they play. Micro antennas, micro chakras. Now, we have codes for these, uh, for these antennas. Uh, and our codes are three-digit codes, UCU, GAU. These are chemical codes that we use to define uh, different combinations of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen that go into making these antennae. 
So what I have on, uh, on this list right here, these are the 20 known amino acids, the 20 known antenna that define human as you and I know human today. Some of these you've probably heard about, the lysine and the tryptophan that has been very controversial on the, uh, um, on the markets today. So you may think of these as the 20 antenna that we have available to us right now. So the 64 possibilities of codes that we call the human genetic code uh, are what you're seeing here. And there's a mystery surrounding these codes. And this is a mystery that has been with us, uh, uh, the life sciences, even to this moment, even to this moment. And the mystery looks like this. We have 64 possibilities, 64 possibilities. And of these 64 possibilities, it appears that only 20 of these codes are turned on right now for us, the 20 amino acids. So I'm going to go over to the board and let's look at this and see what this means to us. 64 possibilities of code that we have available to us. Why aren't all 64 possibilities turned on? We have 20 amino acids. If these are antenna, we have 64 possibilities of antenna. If only 20 antenna are turned on, where are the rest of them? Where are the rest of the antenna? Why don't we have the other 44 antenna turned on for us? That's the mystery in the life sciences. That, that continues to be a mystery in, in this moment. Well, let's look into this a little deeper. And I'd like to share researchers are lending us new clues and uh, new evidence into what this information means. Uh, for example, I've uh, put a, a box around the amino acid of leucine. So leucine is defined as UUA. That's a leucine, and, and that's fine. But look at this. UUG is a completely different chemical combination, and it's still leucine. And CUU is still leucine. CUC, CUA, CUG. Why is it that all of these don't result in separate individual and different patterns? Why do they all code for exactly the same amino acid of leucine? Why are they so generalized? That's the mystery in the life sciences today. Well, what researchers have been able to show us, and this is a, a pretty amazing thing to say. The mystery has always been, when we look at, uh, at genetic codes, when we see those amino acids lined up on the double helix, what is it that determines whether the amino acids, whether the antenna are turned off or on? Well, within just recent years, through uh, the HeartMath Institute, people like Dan Winter uh, working with HeartMath, what has been discovered is this, is that there is a switch that turns off and turns on where those coding sites lie, and that the switch uh, for that turning off and turning on is what we call emotion. And this is the first time that we've ever seen the patterns of emotion directly physically linked to human genetic material. So what I'm saying is this. When you look at the double helix, the green is the double helix of the DNA on this image. What Dan Winter says is the long wave of emotion programs this shorter wave of DNA. So emotion, the long wave, the long red wave of emotion, wherever this wave of emotion touches, where it crosses this double helix, is what determines where the site is that that code will either be turned off or turned on. If we're going to have an antenna at this site, it will only be turned on if the wave of emotion crosses this, um, this double helix. Well, this is really interesting for us because two things. First of all, uh, the waves of emotion Researchers have determined that you and I are primarily capable of only two emotions, many derivatives of those emotions, and two primary emotions, fear and love. Fear and love. Well, fear is a long, slow wave of emotion. So this wave of fear is a long, slow wave and touches relatively few sites on this DNA. So an individual living in fear is limited to the number of antenna that they have available to them. Whereas an individual uh, living in the pattern of love, this is love in DNA. You can see it's, it's a higher frequency, shorter uh, wave, many more potential sites for coding uh, along that genetic pattern. 
This information, this is amazing. This is the first time we've ever had a hard digital link between emotion and genetics. And what we're saying is this, that the way you interpret and perceive emotion in your lives directly, linear, linearly affects and determines how your body responds genetically. In compassion, in love, you have the opportunity, and it is an opportunity, to uh, encode many more genetic patterns within your body. When you live in fear, when you live in depression, it's not wrong and it's not bad. Please do not hear that. What fear and depression allow you to do is to have the opportunity of the consequence of fewer numbers of those codes that are turned on, and they're changeable. You have the opportunity through your life to determine which of these codes uh, you're actually using. This pattern, this particular image, this is some research that was done through the HeartMath Institute, and uh, a brilliant work by a gentleman named Vladimir Popanov, uh, uh, a Russian researcher. And what he determined was this. They took human DNA tissue, placed it into a, a vacuum tube, and measured the photons in that tube. Well, actually, they measured the photons just before the tissue went into that tube. And what they found was that the photons were scattered. Let me show you this on the, on the drawing. What they found was that the photons were scattered in this vacuum tube. So here's the tube. Here are random photons. And they said, okay, that's fine. That's what we would expect. Into this vacuum tube now, they placed human DNA, human tissue. I'm not sure where the tissue came from or what it was. So let's put a little double helix in there. And then they measured the photons again and what they found astounded the researchers. It astounds me to this day. What they found was that the patterns of light aligned themselves. Let's make light red. The patterns of light aligned themselves along the axis of the DNA. That's what I'm showing here. So I'm showing uh, right here on this slide. The patterns of light align themselves along the axis of this DNA. What they can say is, what we can say from this, is that DNA entrains light. Now, the really interesting thing was when they took the DNA out of the vacuum, the light was still entrained in that pattern, even though the DNA wasn't there. And the researchers call this now the phantom DNA effect. And what they are saying, what we can say very accurately, is that light responds to our genetic material and in that, with that piece of information now, for the first time, what we have is a link between emotion, DNA, and light, which is what our world is made out of, as emotion, thoughts, love, fear, whatever they are, as emotion determines the patterns and the codes in the DNA, and the DNA determines the patterns of light. So DNA serves as a template for the patterns of light around us. For the first time, we have hard, physical, direct evidence, digital evidence, that our emotions and our thoughts directly affect the physical world around us. And that is an amazing thing for me to be able to say to you. Not only does it affect the world around us, it affects the world within us. The energetic systems of the body, the nervous systems, the nervous pathways, and the chakras are all determined through our uh, experience of emotion and feeling, how emotion and feeling trip the switches of genetic material and our body resulting as an expression of that. Okay, so let's review a little bit. Let's see, let's see what we've got here. We've just covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. What, uh, what you're seeing here, this is uh, an image, a schematic, of an electromagnetic experience. The blue that you're seeing here, this is the electrical portion, this is thought and emotion. And offset by 90 degrees from this thought, trailing behind, if, you, if this were three-dimensional, this would be coming out toward you and going back into the screen. The red are the magnetic fields that we are accustomed to in our world. So historically, whenever we've had a thought or a feeling or an emotion, uh, the lag time between the time that that thought is generated and when it comes to fruition 
is the result of these dense magnetic fields. Think of the magnetic fields as, as the glue, as the muck, sticky stuff that prevents these thoughts from manifesting instantly. When you have a fantasy, why doesn't your fantasy come true immediately? And, and think how confusing your world would be if it did. Well, it's because these magnetic fields prevent that from happening. Well, look what's happening in our world right now. You and I are living a time of decreased magnetics, many fewer magnetics. There's no glue, there's no muck, no sticky stuff left to prevent these thoughts from manifesting quickly. What's actually happening, and this is, this is the beauty of this process, when you go to the sacred sites throughout the world, many sacred sites, what we're seeing, now we're able to bring much of this information all together now and synthesize this into, uh, uh, into the, the patterns that are allowing our life to unfold as they're unfolding. What we're seeing is this, that in many of the sacred sites throughout the world, the chambers that were the sacred sites, those chambers built 1,000 years ago, maybe in Chaco Canyon, 5,000 years ago, some cases 11 and 13,000 years ago, those chambers simulated then what you and I are living right now. I'll go to the board and show you this. Many of those chambers simulated low magnetics then. They simulated high frequency then. Every once in a while, we'll find a sacred site in a chamber that simulates both of them together. Now think about this. Think about what this means. It means thousands of years ago, the ancients knew of this time in history, and they knew that you would be living this time in history, they built chambers then to simulate and to model what you are living now in your living room. You don't have to go to a sacred site to find and to have this experience. They immersed themselves into those chambers and they recorded what the experience meant to them. They passed it down to you through what became ancient, sacred, uh, and in some cases, religious texts, providing uh, essentially a roadmap of what a human may be expected to do to move gracefully through this time in history. Well, let's look at some of these sacred sites. Machu Picchu uh, in Peru, beautiful, beautiful examples of the chambers, the, uh, uh, many of the caves and the temples in the Tibetan highlands. We find examples of, uh, of these same chambers. And you do not even have to go outside of our country, right in our own backyard, uh, Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, beautiful, beautiful temples anywhere else in the world you go and see uh, uh, archaeological sites on this massive of a scale they're called temple complexes in, uh, in North America they're called Indian ruins for some odd reason well in this particular temple complex this is one of over 2800 archaeological sites in Chaco Canyon this is one of, uh, of only 12 that have been excavated and restored 900 rooms in this site alone, and the rooms are, uh, are all situated around circular stone chambers built into the ground called kivas. There are 36 of them. You can see some of them right here. Um, not far from this site, right across the canyon, is one large kiva. This is over 90 feet in diameter, Casa Rinconada. These chambers, these tuned resonant chambers, simulate either low magnetics or high frequency or both so that the initiate may know themselves then in these chambers and know what the body response to these experiences are then you and I no longer need these temples we no longer need these sites this is a, a beautiful image of a restoration from inside of a kiva in northern uh, uh, by Aztec New Mexico in northern New Mexico uh, look how Egyptian this looks whenever I see these images I always think uh, of an Egyptian influence here. This is a restoration of what these used to look like uh, 900 and 1,000 years ago is, is uh, approximately where these are dating to. These chambers and sacred sites. Well, possibly the best known of these chambers and sacred sites uh, is a particular chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza. And when you look at, uh, at these images, I put this in here intentionally, many people believe that this is the Great Pyramid uh, because it appears to be the tallest. Some of the books on the Great Pyramid actually show this on the cover. Uh, this is not the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid is the one with the, the flat top in the back. Uh, where we're sitting, it appears to be smaller. It's actually uh, uh, much larger than this one. And it's within this chamber, within this chamber of the Great Pyramid. 
in a very special chamber, the king's chamber, the chamber of light, as it's called in the ancient texts, in a very special passageway leading up to that chamber, and in a very special box within that chamber called the sarcophagus. This is an image of the sarcophagus that was uh, taken at night. It's illuminated from within. That many initiates in the, in the mystery schools in our past simulated and modeled for themselves precisely what you and I are living in this moment right now. This is uh, another image of this, this beautiful granite sarcophagus. The Tibetan records say that the man we know as Jesus of Nazareth completed his initiations in this chamber. If you have the opportunity to go and lie in this granite sarcophagus, there's a very good chance that you are lying precisely in the same place where, uh, uh, where Christ was uh, just about 2,000 years ago and many other initiates. Uh, recent records are showing that Moses also uh, had the opportunity to experience and to complete his initiation in this chamber before he led uh, his people out of, um, out of Egypt. So this is the granite sarcophagus. This chamber simulated then what you and I are living now so that our experience would be the, the roadmap, the path to our experience would be laid out for us if we had the wisdom to recognize it. And I believe that's what we're experiencing right now. Now let's go into some other chambers. Uh, in Egypt, for example, traditional Egyptian um, history. Uh, I just returned from Egypt a few weeks ago, and uh, many of the tour guides are still saying that. They're saying that they were built to worship uh, the gods of light, the gods of dark, um, the gods of war. Well, you know, the only people that really say that are uh, the tour guides and some of the history books, because the Egyptians themselves and the temple walls and the mystery schools give us a much different story. And what they say is this. I'm going to use this particular temple uh, to begin an example. Uh, this is the, the temple of, of Karnak. Just outside of the Karnak complex, there is a, a small temple that's, that's generally closed to the public, dedicated to the uh, body of a woman and the head of a lioness whose name is Sekhmet. Sekhmet, S-E-K-M-E-T. Now, traditional uh, Egyptian history says that Sekhmet was the goddess of war. And wherever you would see the goddess of war, Sekhmet, you would see uh, uh, individuals praying for a good war or praying not to have war or, or something surrounding uh, uh, the act of war. What the mystery schools say and what the temple walls themselves say is that this wasn't a temple built to worship anyone, that these chambers were built and dedicated to some aspect. They isolated some aspect of the human psyche, some aspect of the human personality, and the initiates had the opportunity to immerse themselves in this temple for some period of time to master that aspect of their lives. So for example, Sekhmet, not the goddess of war, Sekhmet was dedicated to the warrior that lives within every human who has ever lived, the warrior within you. You know that warrior very well. You know how to use that warrior do you know when that warrior is appropriate? Your relationships will teach you the mastery as you have the wisdom to allow and recognize that appropriateness. The, 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 uh, uh, the warrior within, the temple of Sekhmet. Uh, the temple of Isis in the island of Philae. This is a beautiful temple uh, dedicated to two different aspects within the individual. Uh, the aspect of fidelity uh, which has many different meanings in many cultures. Fidelity to oneself, fidelity to the truth of one's path in life. That, that was one aspect of the Temple of Isis and the love that comes from that fidelity. Conjugal fidelity, the fidelity to commitments made to another in conjugal agreements. Uh, beautiful temple complex, very well restored. We uh, just recently returned from, from this particular temple. Um, the temples of Hathor, this is interesting. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this. Uh, throughout Egypt, until recently, whenever you would see Hathor represented on a temple, you would see it like this. The face would be smoothed off and erased and taken away. When the Coptic Christians came through this part of the world centuries ago, um, they didn't like what Hathor was representing in their belief system. They chose not to destroy the temple, simply to wipe the faces away. 
And you'll see this throughout Egypt. Uh, you can see the, the faces are simply chiseled off of the temple walls and the columns. Well, until recently, we really didn't know what this Hathor looked like because all the temples had been defaced. Uh, 1986, 87, I was in Egypt and uh, happened to be there during a time when they were excavating, the uh, authorities were excavating to build a military bunker. And uh, as happened so often, they dug into the ground to build this bunker and they found uh, a temple complex that had been lost in the, the history and the memory uh, of the Nile floods that covered it in mud every year. And it was a small temple, small chapel dedicated to Hathor. Uh, and it was the first time we ever really had a good view of what Hathor looked like. So I'd like to share that with you. This is our, um, our Egyptian guard that is letting us pass through this highly technical and very secured area, uh, this fence right here, down into the enclosure. I'll orient you. This is ground level right here. So we're down ground level. And what you're seeing, these are the tops of the columns of the Hathor temple. And the floor is still 30 feet below the ground level. So they haven't excavated down. We're standing at the tops of, of the columns. Uh, and I just returned a few weeks ago from this very site, and they have not done any more excavation. They're, they are not in any big hurry to excavate this site. So this is what Hathor looks like. You notice the, the beautifully uh, delicate features uh, of the, the lips, the eyes, the ears. Absolutely beautiful image. Hathor represented love, the love of oneself, the joy in the love of life. The reason I place these images here for you now is because it's interesting, no matter what temple you go to in Egypt, whether it's the temple of rage, uh, the temple of the warrior within, the temple of light, the temple of darkness, uh, the temples of lust, a uh, great temple to be stuck in for 30 years or so, whatever temple you go into, you will find the image of Hathor, the image of love, outside of those temples because it is in love that we are asked to know ourselves in rage. In love, we are asked to know our, the hate within in the past. We are asked to know of the light and the dark and uh, uh, the jealousy and the lust. In love, we are asked, asking ourselves to have the experience of life. And the Hathor, the energy, the patterns of Hathor at each of those temples to remind us of that. Uh, the temples of experience. The initiates thousands of years ago had the luxury of going into a temple and isolating some aspect of their experience and staying in that temple until they had mastered that emotion, staying in that temple for days or weeks or perhaps an entire lifetime. Maybe they were stuck in a, a particular temple, uh, the, temple of, um, the temple of love and the temple of what love and relationships are all about. Uh, as they progressed and moved forward through these temples, they would move on to the temples of knowledge and the temples of wisdom prior to their final initiations. Now, the reason I'm saying this to you now is because you and I no longer have the luxury of moving into a temple and isolating some aspect of emotion for years or for a lifetime. We live those temples every day in our lives through our relationships. Relationships are the temples that are allowing us to know ourselves in all ways, to know of the, the warrior within, to know of our anger and our rage and our joy and our ecstasy. The temples do not have to be painful. Uh, and as we redefine pain and fear in our lives, what we find is they are all opportunities. They are opportunities to know ourselves. The temples of knowledge. This is one of the most uh, amazing temples in the Abydos Temple complex, uh, the temple of Seti I, just behind and below this temple now is uh, we're seeing a site that is now being dated at over 22,000 years old. They're dating this, uh, it's empirical evidence, from the, the layers of Nile flooding, the times that the river has, uh, has flooded and receded. They've counted at least 22,000 layers covering this temple site. Well, this particular temple, um, probably one of the oldest in Egypt, is also one of the most amazing. When I was there in 1986, they, uh, we see this grass growing. This is a marsh in a swampy area. And uh, what they did was they put this rickety little uh, bridge down here for us so that we could walk across the water and examine the inside of these, of these solid uh, granite walls. And uh, I'm going to go back a slide and point something out to you. 
Look at the, how these walls are constructed. Look at this tongue and groove construction of these massive granite blocks weighing 60 and 80 tons apiece. This is unique architecture, not to Egypt uh, alone. We don't see this anywhere else in the world in modern times. And we, uh, we know that these now, or we're suspecting, these are at least 22,000 years old. Well, as we go down into these temple walls, we find even more of a mystery, perhaps. As you begin to see very specific patterns, geometric patterns, very non-Egyptian, upon these walls, the mystery itself comes from how these were even produced. They're not painted. They're not etched. They are literally flash burned with a rapid, intense heat onto solid granite high quartz walls thousands of years ago. Uh, the only technology we have today that would even approach that would be a laser, and a laser probably would not do it because a laser would be so heat or so hot, excuse me, that it would melt the quartz crystals in the granite. And this quartz isn't melted; it's simply scorched. So there's a mystery as to how this pattern uh, has even come about. Well, this pattern of 19 interlocking circles in the science of sacred geometry uh, is now known as the Flower of Life. It is referenced in uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth that we spoke of earlier, uh, in the text that were over 13,000 years old. So it wouldn't surprise me that this temple may be over 22,000 years old. Um, historians don't like those numbers. Uh, geologists have no problem with those numbers at all. So it's interesting to see how, how these dating, uh, the dating methods and how the history and the sequence is unfolding. Well, this particular pattern is literally a two-dimensional informational system that was left to us through the temples of wisdom. And what may be said about this particular temple is that all that may be known, not experienced, not felt, not emoted, all that may be known in terms of our mathematical world uh, is embodied within the geometric patterns that we see here. In case you couldn't see that well, uh, I've put this schematic here for you. What you're seeing are a series of, uh, of curves, interlocking curves, uh, like the CBSI, looking like this. Those interlocking curves in the science of sacred geometry represent what is called the Vesica Pisces. And what we're saying about the Vesica Pisces is that each of those curves represents uh, um, a male and a female energy in the old terms. In the new terms, we call this uh, electrical and magnetic information in the 20th century idiom. Uh, it's the science of the union of opposites. And in the science of sacred geometry, what we say in the flower of life, it was within the inner and the outer walls, these two concentric circles of this pattern, these two concentric circles represent metaphorically the inner and the outer wall of the female egg, the female ovum. And what we say is that within those two circles represent all possibilities as potential. Anything can happen through the union of opposites and, uh, and the way that those unions are allowed, electrical and magnetic energy. This is the temple of wisdom, one of the temples of wisdom that we have in Egypt. Uh, as the initiates would move through their lives mastering emotion, the temples of knowledge then would be meaningful to them, just like it is in our lives today. Without the context, without knowing what our lives mean to us, the knowledge is meaningless to us. We would move from the temples of emotion and the temples of knowledge then to the temples of wisdom. Uh, this image that you're seeing, uh, the temple of the Sphinx, the temple of, of the wisdom. This is where the ancient texts uh, tell us that the Hall of Records is actually maintained. The records of human history that resulted from the living of the knowledge, from the wisdom of the knowledge of our cycle from this time back to the last shift of the ages. This is the temple that Edgar Cayce references time and time again. Uh, it's interesting, again, I was just uh, at, uh, in Egypt within the last few weeks. Three doorways now, three passageways have been found that lead into hallways, stairways, and sealed stone and wooden doors that are leading to a, a, some chamber inside of this temple, um, probably in 1996, as they're estimating now that these doorways will be open. So it'll be interesting to see how, uh, how that comes about. So the, uh, the temples of, um, of wisdom. 
You and I live these temples. We're living the identical process to the initiates of old in our lives today. You and I do not have the luxury of going to a temple to isolate, going to a stone building to isolate these aspects of our lives. Our temples have, in fact, become our temples of relationship. This is the way the wisdom comes to us. Now, I've, I've given you a schematic here uh, uh, as an illustration of, uh, of the way the processes are coming to us. To the degree that you and I view the events in our lives purely through the logic of the mind, through the left and the right brain, the polarity of the mind, you and I always will live in that polarity. That's what locks us into the polarity. That's what locks us into the separation. And there's nothing wrong with that. So please not hear me say that it is wrong. It is a choice to remain locked into that polarity. And the ancients tell us that logic is very important. The logical mind is a key portion, plays a key role in our experience. And they also say that it goes even farther than that. Uh, what they say is that in addition to the logic of the mind, that it is the wisdom of the heart, the wisdom of the heart that tempers the logic of the mind. These concentric circles centering around the heart, the seven layer liquid crystal uh, oscillator that we call the heart. Uh, it's also interesting that in our language, we have no word to describe a wisdom that comes from the heart. I, I have to go to another culture. Uh, part of my heritage is, 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 heritage is Cherokee. And in the Cherokee traditions, there is a word, uh, no right, no wrong, no good, no bad. It simply sees an event for what it is and says, ah, this is what it is, and these are the consequences of this event. The word for that is shante ishta, shante ishta, the single eye of the heart. What you and I are asking ourselves to do in this lifetime uh, through the temples of our emotions, through the temples of our relationships, is to find that balance between uh, the logical mind and the wisdom of the heart and live that balance day in and day out. That becomes the compassion that we choose to have in our lives. Uh, this beautiful image uh, I'm showing to you now because in a, in a very real uh, sense, what I'll say to you is that you do not need to go to a temple anywhere on this earth to have these experiences. It, it's fun to do that. You may do that, and you may have some very powerful uh, experiences. Those tem temples may be catalysts for memory within your body. That certainly is true, and it's not necessary. Because for me, the greatest temple and the greatest mystery school of all is this temple right here. It's the temple of your soul. It's the temple that has brought you into the room that is allowing you to view you and I, to view this video as we're seeing it right now. And it is in this temple that you will know of yourselves in all ways. And in that knowing, find the mastery that leads you gracefully into the transition, the phase change that the ancients called the shift of the ages. That is the message, I believe, of this and other reference beings. This man lived that science. He lived the science of compassion. He anchored it among us. Uh, I was taught when I was young that the gift of this man was uh, in his death, that he died uh, for my sins, sins that I had not even yet committed in, in my life. And it made about this much sense to me. Uh, so I, I was uh, asked, asking myself to explore further. And what we now know is that this man's gift was not in his death, first of all, because he never died. Uh, if he had died, the message would have been lost. This man resurrected. And resurrection is much different than death. And it was in the resurrection and in the gift of his life, anchoring the message, walking among humans, living the message day in and day out, living compassion, that he became the living bridge. If one person saw the demonstration of his life, then it was anchored in this world and it became a memory. And that memory, that electromagnetic pulse, just like you saw in the cymatics images, that memory is, is the memory that he is the living bridge left for you and I. And he became that bridge. You in your lifetime, now you are being asked to become that living bridge for yourself and for those that you hold most dear in the living day in and day out of whatever your life means to you through the science of compassion. 
becoming a, a compassionate and forgiving being. And there is a science to that. It's, it's not a random, nebulous concept. There are very real parameters that define for us what compassion is all about. We've covered a tremendous amount of information in, uh, in a relatively brief period of time. And I'd like to take just a, a moment to summarize, bring some of these, uh, these concepts into perspective, into focus, and uh, then spend the next few minutes uh, moving from there with personal experiences, describing, uh, making concrete some of the points that may, uh, may appear to be a little bit nebulous uh, at this time. So I, I'd like to step over to our, uh, our board and go through uh, briefly what we began speaking about uh, earlier in this day. Uh, everyone feels that something's happening in their lives. Uh, now for the first time, our scientists are able to digitally quantify what that something is. The Earth is, in fact, experiencing a drop in magnetics and increase in frequency. And they appear to be uh, moving toward a point where they will culminate in what the ancients called the shift of the ages. Through the sacred circuit, you saw the images of the sacred circuit, how every cell in our body is tuned to the brain, which is entrained to the heart and tuned to the Earth. Uh, our body is attempting to match these changes that the Earth is going through. Our body is trying to maintain a tuning, a resonance to these changes. Earth vibrates in an increased fashion and experiences lower and lower magnetics. The only way that our bodies are able to maintain this tuning is through the allowing of our emotions. If you and I were rocks, if we were sitting out on the sidewalk uh, as, uh, as a pile of concrete, we would always be in tune with the earth, we, and we would not have the, the opportunity to feel and emote. And it's through the gift of emotion, the gift of feeling, uh, that we are able to create interference patterns that we call fear, uh, fear uh, impeding our ability to allow this tuning process. So what is happening is you and I are barreling down this road toward the time the ancients called the shift of the ages. Our bodies are attempting to match this tuning within the earth. And the only mechanism that we have that allows that process is our ability to emote and to feel. And you don't have to know any of that. That is the context within which uh, this whole process is unfolding. Now, the way it comes about is that you and I skillfully and masterfully in our lives have learned to create relationships, interpersonal relationships with other people. Not all romantic, although romantic relationships sometimes are the most intense and, and the fastest uh, learning mechanisms that we have. Any relationship, any interpersonal action that you have with another human uh, is a relationship that I'm referencing now. It, it could be a, a two minute relationship with a checkout person at a Safeway or a 30-year relationship with, uh, with a spouse who you've known and loved dearly. Uh, it can be an interpersonal relationship with a coworker, with a supervisor, with a sibling, or simply a friend. And even if you live on a mountaintop all by yourself and you never see another person, you're still having a relationship with yourself. So you are always in relationship with someone. Those relationships are your opportunity to experience emotion. Emotion is what it is that turns off and on the patterns of DNA within your body that allow you to gracefully transition through these experiences. Times of tremendous change in very compressed time frames. That is why so many people now are saying, many people are saying that time, they, they sense that time is speeding up. Well, you measure time your cells measure time by the number of pulses per second that our planet emanates. Well, those number of pulses have gone from 7.8 to at least 8.6 cycles per second. So yes, you, I would expect that you will sense that time speeding up because it is. As the days grow shorter, Earth pulsates faster. Um, many people now are saying that they are experiencing very intense emotions through uh, even more intense relationships. And if that's true, uh, I would not be surprised if it is true because of this. As we get closer and closer to, to this time that the ancients called the shift of the ages, we are asking ourselves with a greater and greater sense of urgency to find balance, to reconcile the patterns of our lives so that they may serve us and not hinder us in the evolutionary path 
along this road to the shift. Uh, many people are, are saying now that they are sensing um, uh, a tremendous sense of, of anxiety and urgency within their bodies. They are sensing on some level, they are feeling this process as it, as it unfolds within our lives. Well, you know, as I talk to people uh, in many parts of the world, I have the opportunity uh, to share this information. Uh, this is the ninth year now that Zero Point Information has been offered in one format or another. And people say to me, I understand what you're saying here. What good does it do if, if I change and no one else around me changes? What good does it do if, if I remember compassion in my life, if I become compassion, if I remember no hate in a world that has learned to hate in the past, or if I remember no fear in a world that has learned to fear in the past? Well, to help understand what good that does, uh, I have a, a short video clip I'd like to show you. Uh, in the science of chaos theory, there is um, uh, a mathematical equation that defines the point where order and chaos merge. It's a, a membrane where order and chaos come together. And until recently, it was, it was a nebulous uh, uh, theoretical point. And with the advent of high-speed uh, high computers, now we're able to plug the mathematical formula into these computers and create an image, a picture, of what this image actually looks like. We call the resulting image the Mandelbrot set. Your life is holographic in nature. I know that you know that, and I know you've heard that many times. I'd like to take a few moments uh, and pausing in this video to explore precisely what that means to you, your life, in your relationships, your emotions, and your feelings. Every emotion, each feeling, each response that you choose to any given situation affects every other person on this earth to some degree. That's the beauty of the holographic model. That's the power in compassion. Together, let's explore the nature of this relationship through an image that researchers are calling the Mandelbrot set. What you're seeing on your screen right here, this is an image of a mathematical point uh, that is called the Mandelbrot set. It is a point in chaos theory where order and chaos merge. And where they come together, that point may de be defined mathematically. As we feed the mathematics into computers, this is the graphic equivalent of that boundary between order and chaos, the Mandelbrot set. Now, the reason I use this image to describe this concept is because this is a very good example of a hologram. Uh, one definition of a hologram may go something like this. In a hologram, the whole pattern is whole and complete unto itself. And if you were to take any little portion of this whole out and examine it closely, you will see the entire pattern repeating itself again and again and again. This is the way the Mandelbrot set works. This entire image is called the Mandelbrot set. And as you'll see around the periphery, of the Mandelbrot set, you'll see many, many other little patterns. These are all little Mandelbrots. Now, we're going to use the power of our computer to take us into this image. We will zoom into the image, and you'll see that as we zoom into this image, the pattern repeats itself again and again and again. And this is where the beauty of the holographic model becomes apparent. Because it goes like this. Anywhere, anywhere in this pattern, if we were to change one little aspect on any one of these little holograms, on any one of these little Mandelbrots, that change would be reflected throughout the entire system. Every place where you saw this pattern would reflect that change, no matter where in the system we place the change. Our consciousness works that way. To the degree that you allow yourself to remember the gift of compassion, to remember the option of no hate, and no fear in a world that has learned to hate and fear. To the degree that you allow that in your little piece of our universe, to some degree that change is our consciousness works that way. To the degree that you allow yourself to remember the gift of compassion, to remember the option of no hate and no fear in a world that has learned to hate and fear. To the degree that you allow that in your little piece of our universe, to some degree, that change is reflected throughout the entire pattern of our universe because we are holographic in nature. Well, let's explore this relationship together as 
through our computer, we allow the computer to take us deeply into this model. There's our Mandelbrot set. And you can see that we are zooming into a complete portion, very specific portion of this set. And notice all along the periphery, all along the edges of the pattern, you see many, many, many Mandelbrot sets. As you listen to the music from this, it's almost a meditation as we move into this powerful pattern, the model that represents our consciousness. You see all the little Mandelbrot sets lining up side by side. Any change in any one of those sets would be reflected throughout the entire pattern, throughout the whole. There's something very interesting that will happen as we move farther and farther, deeper and deeper into the innermost regions of this pattern. And we see the pattern repeat itself over and over again. We're moving to an end point. And as we reach this end point, what you'll see is that we end up with precisely the same pattern that we began with. Your relationships work in this manner. Your life works in this manner. The patterns are with you no matter where you go, no matter how far deeply into your life you move or how far you attempt to remove yourself from the patterns of life. You are holographic in nature. No matter where you move to, what part of the world, what part of the country, no matter how many relationships you move into or out of. Uh, I did not want to prolong the relationship. I didn't want to spend the, the time and the money pursuing this case. Uh, and I felt like it was a very powerful lesson for me to let it go, and I did. And immediately after, I let that go. And there was a whole process that I went through to get to that point through the Essene sciences of compassion. <clears throat> Excuse me. What happened was uh, that every relationship that was being held close to me through the charge of those things that I judged, every relationship that was being held by the charge of honesty and integrity uh, and trust, every one of those relationships fell away at the same time because of the holographic nature of what I had released in the forgiveness of this person. Now, the beauty of this, there, there's a lot more to this story. Uh, the lessons that I learned, my, probably the most powerful lesson was a lesson of discernment. Uh, prior to that time, trust for me had been binary. Trust was something that I either did or I didn't. You either trusted someone or you do not trust someone. Um, I, up until that time, had had a, a tendency to, to entrust people with a greater level of trust than they themselves were willing to allow, a greater trust than they, they found themselves worthy of. The discernment of, of trust was a powerful lesson for me. Um, and the, uh, the opportunity for me to trust within my own feelings. There was something really interesting that happened with each of those three people that came into my life. Each of those three people, I had a feeling about them. And I discounted the feeling. I ignored the feeling as I felt it. So for example, the business relationship, and this is just so amazing, the businessman within the first 10 minutes of our meeting at, um, at the home of, uh, of an acquaintance in Northern California, I asked him a question I asked very few people out of the blue. I just said, when's your birthday? And he said, oh, my birthday is June 28, 1954. And I said, well, that's exactly when my birthday is, the same month, the same day, and the same year. We're both Cancerians. I thought, what, what a beautiful basis for a, a business relationship, the feeling world of a Cancerian. And he looked at me in that moment, and he said something to me, and I discounted it. He looked at me in that moment, and he said, you know, I'm your evil twin. And I heard it, and I discounted it through my logic. What I said was, oh, Greg, get off of it. You know, that's, that's silly for you to think uh, that it wouldn't be. He, he was just kidding when he said that. He looked at me when he said that. I had a feeling and I discounted it. I had a similar feeling with a romantic relationship. I had a similar feeling with a friend who was coming to live on my property, and I discounted all of those. So along with the lesson of discernment of trust, I also had a very powerful lesson uh, of trusting myself and my personal feelings in dealings and relationships with other people. And I know that, that you do the same, and the reason I share this story with you 
uh, is because it is so important to trust those feelings and to know what those feelings are saying to you. Um, it was very interesting following this whole series of events. The workmen who were on my property that, uh, uh, that I couldn't pay because there was no money, they said to me, you know, uh, we really love being here in, uh, in northern New Mexico this time of year in the summer. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, would you consider an exchange of some kind, a trade for the work we're doing on, on your property? And I said, well, you bet. Uh, what would I possibly have that you would be interested in? And they said, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, contractor, the head workman, said to me that uh, at that time, his, he and his girlfriend had always wanted to go to Egypt, and they always wanted to go to Peru. And would I be willing to take them in exchange for the work that was being done on the property? And I said, you bet. And we worked out uh, a system. The work got done. No money was exchanged. And the next year, they went with me uh, uh, to Peru. Um, it's interesting how something like that works. The, uh, uh, the friendship, the gentleman that was living on my property, it wasn't long before it made no sense for him to live with me uh, anymore at all as the romantic relationship. They disintegrated very quickly without me really doing anything as this process was unfolding uh, within, uh, within our experience. So the, the two primary lessons that came from that experience, discernment of trust and trusting uh, the feelings that come from within. Now the business relationship, this was a gentleman who was booking my events for me and as I left that relationship, I left all the events. There were no events for me to do from that point forward. No seminars, no lectures, uh, no, no tours. And I had nothing to go to. And it happened on a weekend. Well, it wasn't two days later, Tuesday of the following week, I had a phone call. And I had a phone call from a woman that lives in the, in the Northeast. Uh, a beautiful woman lives there. Uh, and she said, I heard about you through some friends. I would like to, uh, to book your events and, uh, and to bring you into this part of the country. Would you be willing to work with me in that respect? And the first thing I asked her, the first thing out of my mouth, I said, I would, I'd be willing to consider it. When is your birthday? And she said to me, my birthday is June 28, 1954. The exact identical birthday of myself and the gentleman who I just had a horrible time with in this business relationship. And, uh, and I came very close to hanging up the phone and walking away from that relationship. And something within me said no. I said, you know, just because I had this experience one time with, with this person, uh, I didn't feel that that warranted negating every subsequent relationship uh, that looked like it was going to be the same. And, and I shared the story with her. I shared the story of the gentleman uh, who had the same birthday as both of us, who. Um, would book the events for me and, and was not paying me uh, in a timely fashion. And she laughed and she said, uh, she said, are you willing to give this friendship and this relationship a chance? And I said, uh, sure, you bet, because it felt like the thing to do. And what I'll say to you now is that in trusting my feelings in that moment, what I had the opportunity to do and what I have now, if I had not trusted my feelings, I would have lost one of my, my most dear friends and one of my best business partners that, that uh, I, I've ever had. And the reason I share this portion of the story with you is because I'm finding this happening to many people throughout the country. There's a pattern. It's a pattern that's unfolding for all of us. As we are barreling down this road toward the time the ancients called the shift of the ages, and we skillfully draw the experiences to us that allow us relationships and in those relationships, the gift of emotion and what we do with those emotions, here's what's happening. Here's what we're seeing happening. Is that over and over and again, over and over again, we are being offered the same opportunities, the same situations, and the same circumstances, and they're having different outcomes. The outcomes are 180 degrees shifted. They are polarity outcomes. They are uh, very different from the outcomes of the original experience. I'm seeing this happen to many people. And as we consciously recognize these experiences, and we're able to consciously move in with discernment and say, ah, I recognize this pattern, and I see exactly what it is that's happening. Through the Essene traditions, through the Essene sciences, we are offered uh, the seven mysteries of personal relationship. And I've just shared with you the first two 
the first two mysteries, the mirror, the Essene mirror of the mystery of judgment, uh, the things that I judged were being mirrored back to me by the people who were demonstrating to me those things that, uh, that I judged, the three people that came into my life. The first mirror, the mirror of the things that we are in a moment, as someone mirrors back to us that which we are in the moment, if we have the wisdom to recognize that mirror, we have the wisdom to see a powerful portion of ourselves uh, being unveiled as we are seeking to, to find those pieces of ourselves and move toward uh, the wholeness that gracefully carries us through, uh, through this time in our lives. So I offer you these examples as concrete examples um, of how these relationships come about. No one flashes a big neon sign and says, here comes uh, the mystery of, of the first mirror of judgment or the seen mystery of the mirror of that which you are in the moment. It doesn't happen that way. These mysteries sneak up on you usually when you will least expect it. What I've discovered for many people is that they are experiencing what for them are the worst fears, the worst times they could ever imagine happen in, in their lives. And everyone's worst fear is different. Uh, for some people, a worst fear may be the loss uh, of a loved one or those that they hold most dear because their worst fear is the fear of being alone. While the person next to them has no problem being alone, for them, their worst fear uh, may be the loss of, of physical vitality and, and health within their bodies or the loss of, uh, of finances or the ability to generate those finances. Everyone's worst fear is, is different. And as I work with people, as I have over the years, uh, and as I work with clients in, in years past, what I have seen personally is, is also reflected through the Essene texts. And it simply goes like this. Whatever it is that's happening in your life in this moment, whatever that is, when you reach a crisis in your life, it's a time that the ancients called the dark night of the soul. In the dark night of the soul, you will be faced with what for you appear to be the greatest challenges ever of your life. And what the Essene texts say is this, is that it is impossible for you to create for yourself, to draw into your life the circumstances and the situations that give you, that provide you the dark night of the soul until you have amassed to yourself all the tools that will carry you gracefully through that experience. It's impossible. It's impossible for you to create those experiences because it is in the amassing of the tools as you go through the relationships, as you go through the experiences, you develop the arsenal and the array of tools within you it's not until you have assimilated those tools that assimilation is the trigger for creation to bring into you the opportunity to demonstrate your mastery of your worst fears. And that's the way it works. You will go through many, many relationships. You'll go through many, many experiences. Sometimes they take years. Sometimes they take months. And suddenly, you will be faced with, for, with what for you is, is the most tremendous challenge of your life. When that happens, what I will say to you is congratulations. In the amassing of the tools, that experience is not possible until you know that you have everything you need to gracefully move through that time in your life. You know this. Your mother probably said this to you when you were young. She, she probably said, you will never have more on your plate than you're able to deal with. God never gives you more than you are able to deal with. And I believe that's precisely where these funny old sayings that, uh, that our parents and their parents and their parents offered them. It was through that wisdom of the Essene traditions. Um, when we have the opportunity to demonstrate, many people say they feel like they're being tested. They may be perceived as tests and, uh, uh, and just as easily the opportunities may be perceived simply as that, as opportunities to demonstrate the mastery of emotion and the mastery of feeling, the mastery of that which you have become. As we go through the three-day uh, workshops, there, is, uh, there are several things that I offer, several uh, single lines, uh, I believe, of, of knowledge that, uh, that help to anchor concepts, help people remember um, the things that, that we have talked about. 
We've covered a tremendous amount of a very technical, in some cases, um, very esoteric, in some cases, very right brain, in some cases, information. And, uh, and the reality is that we do not have to know any of these things. In the complexity of our being, we are extremely complex beings. In the complexity of our being lies the simplicity that all we have to do is, is be. If you're familiar with, uh, with a Macintosh computer, for example, uh, you know that when you place a little arrow on an image and you simply push a button and all these things happen on that computer, for you to have that degree of simplicity, some very complex things have happened behind the scenes. Well, you and I work in a very similar fashion. In the complexity of who and what we've come to be lies the simplicity that all we have to do is be. All we have to do is, is have the experience. Well, it is, is through that simplicity that I am able to say to you the following things. As you live your life, day in and day out, what I can say to you is this, that you have the opportunity to observe all life as it unfolds around you, and you will primarily experience those things that you identify most with. You will see everything happening in the world as it unfolds, as we barrel down this road uh, toward the shift of the ages. What do you identify with? Do you identify with the joy and the light and the goodness and the beauty of what this world is all about? Or are you focused on the things that you do not like? Is that what your identity, where your identity lies? Those are you this, that as you, as you learn and as you remember the truth of what your world and what your life is all about, uh, it is important in the learning to not be caught in the box of what you've learned in the past, to not be limited by what you have been taught. Take the knowledge that you have been taught and allow it to become a pivotal point to move beyond that which you've been taught, to move into the world of that which is not yet experienced and not yet known. Allow that in your life. I can say to you this, I can say that because and through the laws of creation, the laws of electrical and magnetic interactions, the laws of attraction between opposites, I can say this, that which you most choose to have in your life, the love and the nurturing and the compassion, the companionship and the honesty and the integrity, that which you most choose to have in your life, it's not enough to want them. If you want them, you simply will allow yourself to want and want and want. That which you most choose to have in your life, you must first become. You must become that which you choose to have in your life. You must become the peace that you choose to have in your world. You must become the compassion that you choose to have in your world. You must become the forgiveness that you so desire for your loved ones and your families. And in that becoming, in that becoming, you then are the living bridge to those that you hold most dear as you live and demonstrate the truth of what your life has become. You must become the things that you most choose to have in your life. The opportunity and the mechanism that allows all of us to become those things are the relationships that we have with one another and the opportunity to emote and feel in our lives. So I invite you to explore emotion, to explore feeling, and to explore relationships consciously, with intent. Be aware of why you are drawn to the patterns that you're drawn to. Be aware of why you are drawn into the relationships that you are drawn into. And that awareness is available to you through the Essene mysteries of relationship, the Essene mirrors of self. So I have here for you now a slide summarizing the first four of those seven mysteries. And as you're able to see these mysteries, the, the mysteries of the mirror of um, what you are in the moment, the mysteries of the mirror of that which you judge, the mysteries of the portions of yourself that you have lost or had given away or taken away in your life, uh, the mysteries of your greatest fear, your most forgotten love, these mysteries are available to you through the open literature, through those ancient texts, certainly through uh, the Zero Point workshops. I invite you to explore those mysteries in your own lives and uh, embrace the opportunity to live your life as an initiate of the highest order, 
truly we are living the collective initiation truly we are all given the opportunity to demonstrate to ourselves uh, what this time of initiation means as we move toward the awakening to zero point the collective initiation I'll share with you a story uh, researchers recently related in, uh, in one of the nature magazines uh, this is a very beautiful and very touching story, uh, the story of geese. I know some of you probably have uh, read or heard of this story. Researchers have determined that geese, as they fly together, are, are very closely tuned to one another. As they fly in their flock, for example, that the, the geese, by flying together in a formation, that they add over 71% greater distance in moving together toward a common goal than if each of those geese were to move separately and independently on their own. Uh, we probably have uh, something that we can learn from that. The, uh, the researchers determined that uh, the geese, as the, the lead geese, goose, as the, sorry, <laughs> as the head goose would move forward in his flock, and as he would become tired of his own volition, of his own choice, he would drop and fall behind and allow someone else to take the lead and lead the whole toward their greater goal. Uh, and perhaps for me, the most beautiful portion of, uh, of this, this story is that researchers determined uh, through their experience and through their observation that any time within a flock that uh, any one goose is injured from a hunter's bullet or from illness, and chooses to fall out of the formation, always, 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 that goose is always accompanied by at least two others who will follow him to the ground and will stay with him until he either recovers from his injuries or dies. And if he recovers from the injuries together, the three will follow from one flock to another and another until they reach their original flock. And if he dies, then the one that is left behind will be left, and the other two will catch up with that original flock. The beauty of that story and the metaphor for me is I believe we are essentially living as a flock moving toward a common goal. My choice is that no one gets left behind. Everyone learns at a different level. Everyone understands and accelerates at a different pace, and we're all moving toward the same place. We're all part of this process. So I also invite you, as you live this time of initiation, as you experience through the highest orders of mastery within the emotional body that has become your being, that you become that compassion, you become that patience, you become the forgiveness for those that you see around you who may not have achieved that place exactly at the same time in exactly the same manner that you would expect to see that. It doesn't mean that they should be left behind. It is our opportunity, it is your opportunity to demonstrate your compassion, your forgiveness, uh, your ability to allow yourself to become the living bridge for those that you love the most and hold most dear. If we can learn anything from those geese at all, uh, what we can learn is that no one need be left behind and no one need have this experience alone, that we all are part of one another and part of the experience as we are moving toward this path that we call the shift of the ages. In the words of the ancient and forgotten peoples of this world, in their traditions, there's a word for the force that binds all in its creation. It is simply the word spirit. And I'll share with you now the Hopi prayer of compassion, a prayer to the spirit, the force that underlies all of creation. In that tradition, the word for spirit is Wakan Tanka. This is the prayer to Wakan Tanka. Wakan Tanka. On Shima which are ne 
the way. 